Good day and welcome to the Patently Strategic Podcast, where we discuss all things at the intersection of business, technology, and patents. This podcast is a monthly discussion amongst experts in the field of patenting. It is for inventors, founders, and IP professionals alike, established or aspiring. And in this month's episode, we're talking about the patent reform solutions needed to save the innovation economy with the revolutionaries who are leading the charge. Nearly two decades worth of federal circuit and Supreme Court rulings have thrown the patent system into disarray and weakened patent rights for inventors. Subject matter eligibility is a confused, chaotic mess, leaving even the federal circuit chief justice at a loss on how to determine eligibility. The muddied state of invention enablement puts at risk the software innovations fueling economic growth and the key life science innovations that can save lives. Court interventions on injunctions have made it all but impossible for patent owners to stop others from using their property rights without permission, turning predatory infringement into an efficient business model. This already perfect storm was compounded by an act of Congress a decade ago that inadvertently created a patent-killing machine that has weaponized the patent office against inventors. This has all been bolstered domestically by the deep-pocketed marketing and lobbying campaigns of a big tech industry that is now destroying the ladder it once climbed up on, and is being exploited internationally in an undeclared Cold War that has led to the greatest wealth transfer in human history and begs the existential question, of who is going to develop the technologies of tomorrow. Over the course of the past couple of months, we've sat down with thought leaders across the patent world in an effort to understand the biggest problems plaguing patenting and how those problems impact the innovation economy that still very tightly depends on strong, predictable, and reliable patents. Building on that understanding, we work toward getting a more complete view of the legislative, judicial, and educational solutions needed to get back to the gold standard patent system. In doing so, We not only talk with our guests about their support for the proposed solutions on the table, but we also explore the strongest criticisms. I'm incredibly excited to share that we'll be doing so with the help of distinguished industry heavyweights who are currently deep in the trenches of these issues and working tirelessly towards their solutions. Our guests include Judge Paul Michel, former Chief Justice of the nation's top patent court, who stepped down from his position to be able to speak freely on these problems. Professor Adam Mossoff, law professor at George Mason and simply one of the most brilliant minds in intellectual property law, whose research is regularly leaned on by Congress, the Federal Circuit, and even the Supreme Court on all things patent law and innovation policy. And Randy Landrino, president of U.S. Inventor, the largest inventor advocacy group in the country, a group that has worked diligently to push through legislative and administrative changes to protect inventors and innovative startups. We couldn't be more excited about this opportunity or think of a more impactful way to use this podcast platform. The hosts and panelists you hear from monthly on here all either run or work for patent boutiques that help inventors and early stage startups protect their inventions. We firmly believe that innovation is essential to a healthy economy and that empowered inventors are the key ingredient to the innovation ecosystem. We started this podcast to help inventors, founders, and practitioners deal especially with the sharp corners of this world. We devote so much airtime to trying to help listeners navigate the world as it is, but discussions like the ones we're sharing today present an incredible opportunity to talk about the world as we'd like it to be. Our guests have been exceptionally generous with their time. We recorded over six and a half hours worth of interviews. Recognizing that we want to reach as many people with this as possible, and time is always precious, we've woven highlights from these conversations together into a single episode. Typically, we only do one episode per month, but given the quality of these conversations, and the value and the unique perspectives of each guest. Following publication of this condensed episode, we'll be releasing the full-length interviews and weekly installments for anyone who'd like to go deeper. Before jumping into the thick of this, I do have one quick announcement. If you'd like to help us navigate this complex world, get the word out about these critical issues, and help inventors in the most tangible way possible, I have great news. Aurora is now hiring for a part-time biomedical sciences patent agent. This is a salaried, fully remote position with a flexible work week and benefits. Work where you want, when you want, with a great team, on engaging subject matter, and even get the opportunity to join us on this podcast. Learn more and apply at aurorapatents.com forward slash careers. We'll also include that link in the show notes. Now back to the task at hand. We've been wanting to do a patent reform focused episode like this for a long time, particularly since we covered U.S. Inventors 2021 Decade of Stolen Dreams rallies with our American Inventor Horror Story episode. It was then that we truly witnessed firsthand just how devastating the America Invents Act and the PTAB have been for inventors. Flash forward a couple of years to the present, and the makers of a new documentary entitled The Innovation Race reached out to us to screen their film. The film's premise really resonated with us. I'm going to play a brief segment from the trailer. 
We have a great history of inventors in America who've done great things. The Wright brothers, Thomas Edison. We have a system that has encouraged people to be inventors, to solve problems by providing them with the ownership of what they actually created and patented. How do we turn inventions into innovations? How do we turn an idea in an inventor's head or something in a lab or the garage into a real world product or a real world service that other people can use and enjoy? And that's the key of the patent system. That's what patents as property rights do. A patent is a constitutionally created property right. It's something that our founders, our framers of our constitution recognized. Our patent system used to be very strong and reliable. That's no longer the case. There's some big tech companies up here whispering in the ears of congressmen, sliding campaign donations to them and saying, we want you to dilute the patent system even more. Patents haven't just played an important role in growing our economy. They played a key role in developing the technologies that have made our country safe. Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party in the last five years have made it abundantly clear that they intend to not just compete with the United States, they intend to surpass us and to be the world leader in innovative technology. Innovation drives economic security and national security. We've lost sight of what it is to protect this nation. Those voices you heard are from bipartisan interviews with folks like Senator Chris Coons from Delaware and Representative Thomas Massey from Kentucky, combined with a myriad of inventors, judges, generals, law professors, and policy experts, several of whom you'll hear from today. You can find options for streaming and learn more at innovationracemovie.com. The end of the film, which touches on solutions, provides a launching point for our discussion today. We're going to start with one of the hotter topics because of its recent traction in Congress and the attention or more appropriately, abuse that it's been getting in the courts. And that's the problem of subject matter eligibility. Before being approved or rejected, this is the first gate a patent application must pass through an examination. Whoever invents or discovers any new and useful process, machine, manufacture, or composition of matter, or any new and useful improvement thereof, may obtain a patent therefore. Section 101, as it's called, defines what kinds of things you can patent any new and useful process, machine, manufacture, or composition of matter. The gatekeeping function of this statute, that's largely been unaltered since it was handwritten in 1790, has simply been intended to prevent the patenting of the fundamental building blocks of human ingenuity. Things like letters, numbers, equations, and gravity. This all worked great, as Professor Adam Mossoff will explain, until a series of Supreme Court decisions that he not so affectionately refers to as Four horsemen of the innovation apocalypse. The four horsemen are the Bilski, Myriad, Mayo, and Alice decisions. And these cases resulted in judicially created exceptions for laws of nature, natural phenomena, and abstract ideas, adding new classes of unpatentable subject matter. Listen in as Adam explains. The Supreme Court uh, handed down a series of decisions, four decisions between 2009 and 2014, on this idea of what counts as an actual invention that can be patented. So it's long been recognized that you can only patent inventions, you know, like invented processes or new machines, um, new molecules or a, a molecule that you actually isolate in the lab because molecules aren't isolated out in the world. They're part of living organisms or, and, and other things. Um, you know, and then that molecule becomes isolated and put in, and then you put it into an innovative pill and that becomes a new treatment for cancer or hepatitis. Um, so, you know, you can patent those things, but you can't patent abstract ideas like E equals MC squared. That, um, that's a law of nature. You can't patent two plus two equals four. That's an abstract idea. Um, you can't patent the things in nature themselves. Like you can patent the, the molecule that you've isolated you know, which is, by the way, what all almost all drugs were for 120 years before we started designing them from the protein up with biotech innovations. But um, we're just people going out and scooping up sludge and uh, from 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 jungles and and figuring out there's a molecule in there that actually works against against a, a bacteria. And um, and so you know though you know so the sludge you can't patent. That's just that's just a fact of nature. But that you know microscopic molecule that you've isolated from the sludge and figured out how to put into a pill to get it past the hydrochloric acid in your stomach and get absorbed through your intestinal walls and travel through your blood system and not get attacked by your own body's immune system. That's an invention. Uh, that's a discovery um, that's worth protecting and, is, and it should be protected. So 
this is a very important distinction that has long existed. It's the root of all patent systems, starting in, even in England and in the United States. Um, but the United States or the United States Supreme Court, starting in 2009, really just threw a monkey wrench into the whole into the whole works of this doctrine, um, and a series of decisions vastly expanded the scope of, of of what it means to have something count as an abstract idea or a law of nature and really um you know for lack of a better term just made a mess of of the law um you know they they created a a a two-step framework that provides no guidance to courts uh it's it's a, you know as lawyers like to say it's totally indeterminate um and it's leaning to just willy-nilly decisions by courts um, and led, you know, you know, to willingly decisions by the PTAB um, in invalidating patents. In an industry where words matter more than in most, the Supreme Court was unfortunately light on details. They created these new categories of unpatentable subject matter, but without working definitions to apply them, leaving it up to the lower courts and the patent office to sort through the ambiguity. Here's Randy Landrino. They put it in writing and they, did, they didn't really describe, well, what does that mean exactly? And of course, if, if, it's, if the details aren't there, suddenly you have a whole new area where attorneys can, can do their thing, right? And of course, that's what they've done. And did they ever. The wide array of innovation domains these judicial exceptions were applied to as justification to validate patents really stress tests the bounds of reason. You know, to give you a sense of, you know, just how crazy it's it's become. So patents on on oil dr uh, uh, drilling processes for oil derricks, patents on um, uh, automatic garage door openers, patents on processes for making automobile axles. Um, and in fact, just, uh, you know, uh, uh, just recently, the International Trade Commission, a special court, you know, applied this doctrine to invalidate a patent on a drill bit that used, that used diamonds in the bit in an innovative way. Um, saying that this is just an abstract idea. By the way, that's so they're the courts are to tell you how crazy this is, right? A, an oil derrick, uh, a, a garage door opener, uh, a an automobile axle, and a drill bit are all being referred to as abstract ideas <laughs> or laws of nature. I mean, this is this is insane. These are classic industrial and 20th century inventions that are that have long been secured by patents that have been upheld as valid as patentable inventions by courts going back 200 years. And now the courts are now saying, no, 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 this is automatically excluded from the patent system. These are abstract ideas or laws of nature. Um, you know, and, and the fact that the judges are able to write these opinions and not just see the absurdity on the face of the opinion itself is just really surprising. Um, and this is completely destabilized patent system um, because patents are no longer reliable and effective property rights. Um, you know, imagine if I said to you, yeah, you can have a property right in your house, but, you know, it could be potentially invalidated as, you know, an abstract idea by a judge if you sue someone for trespass down the road. Um, or you don't even have to sue someone for trespass. Someone just gets upset at you and can file a petition at an agency to, to have them review and cancel your, your, your deed in your house because your house is built on land and land is a fact of nature and you can't, and you, can't you know, have title and, and facts of nature. You know, th this, you know, this sounds absurd and it sounds like, a, you know, that can't be because that's so crazy sounding, but that's actually effectively what's happening in the courts with respect to patents right now. And they've invalidated thousands of patents. Now to appreciate where this inevitably goes, it's important to understand the historical significance of eligibility in U.S. patent law and the profound impact it's had on shaping the economy. First understand, you know, why, uh, where we started from. The United States, be, you know, has always been... Um, uh, a leader uh, a, a, um, in uh, worldwide in terms of its willingness to provide protections to next stage innovations um, and um, and cutting edge innovations. Uh, so this has been a key part of the U.S. patent system from the very beginning. So I mean, just one small example. You know, when we broke with England and we put. And we, for the founders, for the very first time, put patents in the Constitution. Never been done before in history as well. Another innovation. Um, you know, when con very first Congress in 1790, right? They're spending weeks debating about how do we refer to President Washington? Do we call him His Excellency? Do we call him Mr. President? Do we call him the Excellency, the Presidency? Because, you know, because he was the analog to the British King. So they were kind of trying to figure out, you know, what do we call him? You know, while they're debating that for weeks, they they, they immediately enact 
the 1790 Patent Act because they know like that's important <laughs> that, that, that we need to get the country going and innovation and protecting innovation with property rights is the basis for doing that. And so um, and but. They broke from England in a lot of ways um, in creating our patent system. So it's very common for people to say, oh, our patent system came from England. And, that, and that's certainly true. There's elements of our patent system that did. But there's also novel new elements in our patent system. Like we were, we embraced a first to invent system. England uh, was not a first to invent. So we embraced the idea that you are an inventor. So just like the farmer who labors over a year to till the soil and harvest the crops eventually, that the farmers engage in productive labor. And that's the basis for which we then justify legal protection in the in the fruits of the farmer's labors with property rights in the wheat. Um, the inventor engages in productive, innovative labors. And that's the basis by which we secure and protect the inventor's uh, fruits of his or her labors in their invention with a patent, a property right. Um, but we also protected processes. Um, so England never protected processes. Um, so James Watt, who you know invents the first practical steam engine, you know the basis of the entire industrial revolution. Um, you know he couldn't get a patent on the process of the steam engine. He could only get a process on the machine that he invented himself. But the United States said no. Processes are inventions themselves too. They're you know in they are right. You don't go out into the world and find, you know, the, the process of how to make a drug or how to, or how to operate a steam engine that these have to be invented just as much as the machines and, and the, the, and other things that you work on with the processes. And in fact, the very first patent that issued in the United States, to Samuel Hopkins was a process on making potash. Uh, so that type of patent would have never been issued in England. Um, and that's patent number one in the United States. So the, the United States has always been an innovative leader in recognizing that there are innovations that historically are have not been protected um, or did not exist and couldn't be protected or that aren't protected in other countries, but we are protecting them because these are legitimate new creations of, of innovators and they should be protected as property rights like any other uh, fruits of productive labors such that people can then go out into the marketplace and benefit from them themselves and benefit consumers. Um, and so this is why, you know, you know, the, the chemical revolution starts in Germany in the 19th century, but the pharmaceutical revolution, which applies chemistry to 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 drugs uh, to help actual people's lives, shifts to the United States. It's why the Industrial Revolution starts in England, but then shifts to the United States in the 19th century. And it's why then the, the computer revolution doesn't shift from anywhere. It starts in the United States in the 20th century. And it's why the biotech revolution started in the United States. We protected biotech innovation starting in the 1970s and 80s, uh, when other countries said, oh, no, this you know, th this is protecting life, you know, this is, th or this is going to lead to Frankenstein type uh, concerns and things of this sort. And I'd say, said, no, you know, these are, you know, legitimate, actual innovations that uh, scientists and, and, and biologists are coming up with. They will benefit people's lives and these should be patented. And that's why the biotech revolution happens. Um, so, so that was the context of how amazing our patent system is. And it's why our patent system is referred to as the gold standard of, of, of global patent systems. Predictably, this shift in perspective on eligibility has already started a sea change in where investment, innovation, and economic activity are occurring globally. And for added context, the study Adam will refer to involves 1,700 patent applications on the same inventions filed in China, the European Union, and the United States. I published a short study with a, with a colleague a few years ago that showed that not only are we invalidating patents and have destabilized the US patent system, but that, but that other countries haven't done this. And, uh, and so you actually can show that there are patent applications that are being rejected by the patent office for being an abstract idea or law of nature under this patent eligibility doctrine that are the patents on the exact same inventions are now being granted in Europe and in China. And that is really significant because that means people are getting property rights in these inventions in Europe and in China. And, uh, and so we've now flipped, right? So 40 years ago, people were getting property rights and biotech innovations in the United States and not getting them in Europe. And of course, certainly not China at the time. They were totally communist at that time, but, but, um, but they weren't getting them in Europe. That's why the biotech revolution happens in the United States because the property rights were being secured in the United States. So therefore the licensing was occurring here. The venture capital investment was occurring here. The manufacturing started to occur here. All of the economic activity 
that contributes to the growth of our innovation economy, creates jobs, creates these flourishing lives through the products that are being purchased by consumers happens in the countries that secure the property rights. And so we and so we've now flipped it where we're no longer securing those inventions. But other countries are, and these are cutting edge inventions. Josh, you mentioned it. This isn't, you know, this isn't just, you know, uh, garage door openers and and automobile axles. Those are just, I think, exemplify just how crazy the doctrine is. The patents that are being invalidated that I, that we identified are patents in innovative new diagnostic tests for cancer, or you know, you know treatments for diabetes. Um, you know, cutting edge innovations that the United States historically has protected. And and is no longer doing so. Um, and so this is bad by itself, but it's even worse comparatively in the global context, given that people are getting patents in other countries like Europe and in China. And so that's where then the venture capital is going to flow to. That's where the economic activity is going to occur. And if we're seeing evidence of that actually happening. Judge Michelle echoed similar concerns about the chilling effects, in particular, of investments dropping off. Much invention, as you know, is very expensive and very slow to mature. And therefore, it often depends on substantial continuing external funding, often by venture capitalists, but also by other sort of uh, institutions. And that's where the patent system is so critical, because without the protection of patents, many investment decisions will be made in the negative. If we had a stronger patent system as we did 20 years ago, or maybe even 12 years ago, uh, uh, we'd be way better off. Uh, but the but the incentive to make these large investments has dropped off, and now the investments are starting to drop off. Uh, and that's a terrible warning sign and an awful trend that the country needs to reverse as fast as it uh, uh, possibly can. And that's the thing people don't understand. Patents in a way are more about investors than about inventors. So my most important message to people is we have to incentivize the investment or the cures uh, are not going to get to patients. The products are not going to get to consumers. The technology needed to deter China from invading other countries won't get created. So these stakes are enormous. It's it's actually difficult to think of higher stakes than what's uh, involved with the health of the patent system. He goes on to provide some insights into the best possible vector for a fix to the eligibility mess. This really gets to the heart of the matter, and I think this is especially pointed coming from someone who spent 22 years as a federal circuit judge. The problem with courts is they're so bound by precedent, they can't fix it. Once the Supreme Court has said something unhelpful, unwise, in my view, uh, you can't fix it, uh, except by legislation. When you think about it, uh, uh, eligibility already uh, is in the statute. Four classes are deemed eligible. It's right in the plain language of the current Section 101. Along comes the court and rewrites the bill because they didn't like it. They thought other policy approaches were better. Well, number one, I don't think they're right. But more fundamentally, they aren't the right people to be deciding broad questions of national innovation policy. That's for the Congress. The Congress has the skill to do it, and it has the lawful authority to do it. Unelected judges should not be making patent policy, period. And so we turn to our first proposed solution. The Patent Eligibility Restoration Act seeks to put to an end these judicially created exceptions to patent eligibility, while also attempting to strike a balance in preventing the patenting of the fundamental building blocks. It hopes to do so by maintaining the existing statutory categories of eligible subject matter while explicitly enumerating a list of excluded subject matter, resolving legitimate concerns over patenting of mere ideas, the mere discovery of what already exists in nature, and social and cultural content that is believed to be beyond the scope of the patent system. Senator Tom Tillis, a Republican from North Carolina, introduced the first draft of the bill last August, and Senator Chris Coons, a Democrat from Delaware, announced that he has come on as a co-sponsor. The bill has also received broad community support from industry pundits, PTO directors, former judges, and the Biden administration seems to support the idea of reform. But while widely supported in its intent and fueled for traction with bipartisan support, there are some pretty serious questions about a couple of aspects of this bill. There are three concerns we've seen come up a fair amount. How this applies to software, 
use of the word non-technological, and the potential reintroduction of pathogen patents. We'll take on each of these with our guests. We'll turn to the judge first to see if he thinks Congress is on the right track. You, you've said, and I love this quote because when the stakes are high, is no time to pull punches. Uh, quote, the Supreme Court's decisions in the last decade have confused and distorted the law of eligibility. You want to say it's a mess, illogical, unpredictable, chaotic. Bad policy for important innovation, including for promoting human health. Congress needs to rescue the innovation economy from the courts, which have left it a disaster. Let's hope Congress rises to the need, end quote. Does this bill, as it's written, rise to the need? Well, I don't think the bill is perfect because it's uh, uh, still a work in progress. Uh, at, at the time we speak, it's still being uh, refined by small teams of lawyers. Uh, secondly, its political viability is not yet really tested. There might have to be further changes to make it passable. So I don't say it's perfect, but I do think it's very, very good. And I give huge credit to Senator Tillis and Senator Coons for the hearings they held over three days in 2019 with 45 witnesses from an enormously diverse group of stakeholders and experts. Um, uh, and I'm very hopeful that the uh, uh, bill will, uh, that was introduced uh, uh, in the last Congress and is about to be reintroduced uh, in this Congress will move forward and ultimately uh, get passed. And um, it's a little immodest, but uh, 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 I had some hand in the, the shaping of that bill. So uh, I think it's very good uh, being as objective as I can, but I guess I'm partly subjective because I was <laughs> part of the drafting uh, uh, efforts. Um, but it's a great start. It's a very good bill. It would make huge improvements in predictability I've also read a lot of comments in patent media indicating that this bill would overrule the three, or four depending on how you're counting, Supreme Court cases that have put patent eligibility into its present state of disarray. The bill doesn't include explicit language to that effect, so I ask the judge for clarification. Well, it certainly would overrule some of the careless statements the Supreme Court uh, embedded in its opinion deciding the four cases. I say four because I'm going to add Bielski as the first in the quartet time-wise. Uh, but you're right. The other three are more famous and more problematic still. Um, uh, it, it might not uh, necessarily change the decision. Uh, but it would change the doctrine, which is very important, because it's the doctrine that guards future cases. It's the language in the opinion, not just the outcome, eligible or ineligible. Uh, so uh, uh, I, I think that uh, what I would say is the bill overrules most of the four Supreme Court cases, but maybe not uh, at the level of 100%. We also asked Adam if he thought the legislation, as it's written, accomplishes its stated goals. Is the legislation perfect? No. Uh, very rarely is any legislation perfect. <laughs> so uh, if one waits for perfect legislation, one is waiting for Godot, right? <laughs> so, uh, so, um, the, uh, so, you know, is it really, you know, the perfect legislation? No. You know, and I, uh, you, know, I you know, ideally legislation should be very basic, very simple, um, you know, that was, by the way, why the U.S. patent system also worked was because the, the patent statutes were very basic and simple for, for a very long time up until the American Vents Act is the first really kind of excessively complicated patent statutes that are being enacted. Um, you know, there, there's this, the sections of the statutes are typically one, maybe two sentences at most. The sentences are not very long. They're understandable. Um, you know, and that's key to having a property rights system where it's just you have a basic understandable foundation for which then people can go and take their their exclusive rights, their property rights into the marketplace. My, my preference is for us to continue that practice because it's shown economically and historically to be the key to successful legal foundations and property rights for driving economic growth. Um, and so ideally, you know, they really should just pass a statute that's just a couple sentences that just says, all of these Supreme Court decisions from 2009 to 2014, they're just, they're, they're overruled. They're abrogated. We as Congress deem these, these, uh, these judicial opinions by the Supreme Court as mistaken interpretations of what we were trying to achieve when we enacted the patent statutes according to the authorization and constitution for us to do so as Congress. But while not perfect, 
Adam still thinks it's an important step in the right direction. The bill as framed achieves a lot of really good and, you know, and it's never going to be perfect. Um, uh, even the 1952 Patent Act wasn't perfect in every respect. And, um, and, you know, and we should support it, you know, with an eye towards, okay, let's now support it and say something like this should be enacted, and, but maybe it should be some changes on the margins, but at core, it's a good, it's a good thing. And we should be definitely saying that this is a discussion uh, Congress should have. They should be moving this forward and, you know, and working to correct the concerns and the problematic language on the margins while, while that moves forward. The language in particular we should be looking at correcting is where I'd like to turn our attention next. Among those in the industry, some concerns have been expressed that the bill tries to do too much and opens new doors for judicial uncertainty. In a U.S. inventor piece on IP Watchdog, co-authors Paul Morville, Randy Landrino, and Josh Malone argue that in its present state, the bill is immature and that the most important words dangle undefined. In highlighting the associated risk, they point to the problem that got us here in the first place. As we said earlier, Section 101 defines eligible subject matter as whoever invents or discovers any new and useful process, machine, manufacture, or composition of matter, or any new and useful improvement thereof. The Supreme Court somehow found a way to create an exception to the word any, a word that the dictionary says is used to express a lack of restriction. They called this restriction to the word any an abstract idea, but then also failed to define what an abstract idea is. And here we are. We asked Randy about this. You know, the, the devil is in the details. It's like, okay, so it has to be technological. What the heck does that mean? And they didn't, again, there, there, there's a lack. When, when you don't have a, a very finely defined set of terms, everything can go wrong. Everything can go wrong. That's where, that's where you get unintended consequence. I mean, to me, te- technological is anything that, 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 performs a, a function like a like a, a function well wait a minute that's my definition but is that how a judge is going to see it is that how certainly not how the certainly not how the opposing attorney who's trying to invalidate the patent is going to see it they're going to they're going to take every leeway they can to to make an argument to destroy your patent and the law the law has to provide uh, a way for that for you to have some type of um prediction as to whether or not you're going to actually win or lose. And, and, and that prediction, it goes all the way back to, do you file a patent for this thing or not? If you can't predict uh, that your patent is going to stay valid, you can't invest. You can't spend your time and effort. You can't devote your life to this thing. Investors can't come in. You know, you, you, you have to have something that's predictable. And, and I think that's where it falls down. Again, simplicity is the, is, the, is the answer. Simplicity. You heard Randy mention the word technological. In addition to many wanting more explicit language about the four SCOTUS decisions being overruled, the risk of the ambiguity surrounding this word is one of three chief criticisms we frequently see arise around the language in the bill. The others include concerns that the bill could turn software into ineligible subject matter and potentially endanger global health by reintroducing pathogenic patents. If the concerns are valid, those could all be catastrophic outcomes, so it's worth unpacking each. First, to Randy's point, the bill would make ineligible any patent on, quote, a process that is a non-technological economic, financial, business, social, cultural, or artistic process. This means that only processes deemed technological would be patentable. The current bill provides no definition of what technological means and would leave this interpretation up to the courts. And even if the word were defined, the definition would have to encompass whatever innovations the future might hold, which we can't possibly know. Any use of this word ends up either undefined and ambiguous, or defined and overly prescriptive. On to software patents. The bill says, Any person may obtain a patent for a claimed invention that is a process described in such provision if that process is embodied in a machine or manufacturer, unless that machine or manufacturer is recited in a patent claim without integrating, beyond merely storing and executing, the steps of the process that the machine or manufacturer perform. As someone who spent 20 years writing software, I suspect the goal here is excluding non-technological inventions that are merely replicated but now performed on a computer. But that's not what it says. What does merely storing and executing the steps of the process mean? All software does this, so how might future courts run wild with a phrase like this? 
We certainly don't want to trade the Alice decision, something that's made software patents difficult to get, for something that bans software patents altogether. The third concern centers around pathogenic patents. It's been argued that had this legislation been in place, researchers could have patented naturally occurring viral RNA sequences, making it more difficult for others to develop COVID vaccines and drugs, and that the language should be modified to prevent the reintroduction of patents on naturally occurring genomic sequences that are isolated and purified in the lab. I ask Adam and Judge Michelle about all of these concerns. Now, I am a little worried. I'm not, um, you know, I've heard the arguments about the concern about, you know, the uh, invalidation of, of, of software patents. Um, I'm also worried about the, you know, the throwing business method patents also under the bus because I'm not, a, because I think the protection of bit Business methods are processes that have long been protected in our country. They're not new. Again, this is pure rhetoric that they're new. Um, I, I, I highlight in my, on this day in innovation history, business method patents, you know, from the 19th century. Um, and other scholars have found extensive numbers of business method patents going back to the early 19th century. Um, so, um, so these are legitimate processes. The Patent Act says you protect a process and a business method is a process. And so as long as it's novel and non-obvious, <laughs> then you should be able to get a uh, patent on it. It's an invention. But, um, but I, so I'm really concerned about that, that they basically, th they do, it does completely throw business methods under the bus. And given the fact that, you know, that there is a kind of a conflation of business methods with computer software patents, um, you know, that, um, you know, computer software patents will go down too. And I think this is what they're highlighting is that, you know, the language and the statute is not clear on this. And given kind of the constant confusion by judges and lawyers, people should know better, but are nonetheless get confused about these matters. And it's, and the reason why they're confused is because there's massive confusion in the policy debates about these, these issues. Um, so, um, and so that, you know, this could have the effect of, you know, being, you know, being the basis for the invalidation, not just of business method patents, but, uh, or the exclusion of business methods from wholesale from the patent system, but also, you know, the, the wholesale exclusion of, of computer software patents, which would be a disaster. And, and I'm concerned about the new terminology, like tech, you know, technology that is, that is used in this, in, in it as well. The, the, you know, the, I understand from the people who have, you know, drafted the legislation or, you know, supported it and, you know, been part of the process that it's, that it's, um, you know, that they're, they're hoping that there's a significant, you know, body of, of, of law in Europe that applies that term um, and that they're looking hopefully to incorporate that, which is, it's, which is a fairly determinate and, and, and from what I understand, pretty good area of law. I mean, they're more restrictive in it than we would be normally. For the pathogen patent concern, we benefit from some extra context Ashley provided in the interview. You know, you can't patent something in nature, but if you isolate it, so if, you know, there's a virus yeah. and I isolate, you know, whatever capsid protein or something, you know, the DNA for that, then I can patent that DNA. And mm -hmm. now I can own any product stemming from that DNA. And I just isolated it, right? Which, you know, coming from, you know, I'm you know, coming from being a lab rat back in the day, you know, a lot of isolation stuff is easy, right? It's not hard. It's not, you know, we know the components that viruses have and, and things like that. And so does there need to be a little bit more buffering around, you know, yes, if you isolate something, that's great, but you got to, you know, again, you have to take it to a useful end and that's what you protect, right? Oh, I've created a diagnostic assay now that, yes, I use this purified DNA sequence to do whatever with, I can't just protect that purified DNA sequence. Yeah, that that one I know I know that third issue very well, and I think that that is a not a real concern. Um, and um, uh, for uh, for uh, for a couple reasons. Um, so as a preliminary matter, um, so um, I think it was you know I actually made it very clear in her her description of 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 the concern that um, she said, well, it's easy to do, right? Or people already know how to do it. Well, that means that. Uh, you know, well, just because it's patent eligible doesn't mean you get a patent on it. You still have to meet novelty and non-obviousness and disclosure and enablement. Um, and, you know, and this is one of the problems of this debate is that, you know, the people who are uh, opposed to reform, uh, big tech who like to, you know, who love willy-nilly, you know, decision-making to, to, to invalidate lots of different patents, 
um, you know, uh, are more than happy to say, oh, yeah, oh, this will open the floodgates and anyone can get a patent now. No, it's not. It's just one. It's just one requirement. It's one hurdle of a, of a of a very long race of many hurdles that patent applicants have to go through. And this is why patent application process, as you guys know, takes, you know, many years, um, you know, because you're not it's, it's multiple requirements. And each of these requirements is a necessary requirement. Uh, you know, as I tell my students, you know, in teaching patent law, right, you know, this is why you know, every, every defendant argues the entire kitchen sink about why the patent is invalid because all you need is one to stick. Um, and, it, uh, and that's all. Uh, so this is, so just because an isolated molecule is patent eligible, given the isolation, which now makes it not a natural fact, it's now a human creation in the lab, doesn't mean that it's necessarily novel or that it's not obvious. Um, you know, to the extent, in fact, to the extent that, for instance, the entire human genome has now been published, you know, there, there, I think is an entirely legitimate and very real argument that any DNA, any classic kind of DNA patent of the type that issued in the 1990s and to, and, 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 you know, at the turn of the century is just not novel anymore. Right. Um, because it's already known it's, it's part of the prior art. Um, you know, the Fasidas know how to find, uh, know about these things and know how to find them. Um, and even if it's not novel, it's obvious because they know how to find them. It's really super easy, as Ashley said. Exactly. So, you know, it's so you're still having to go through novelty. You're still having to go through non-obviousness and things of that sort. Um, but, you know, but second of all, you know, the isolation of 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 molecules of DNA, you know, this is the biotech revolution. Um, you know, that is, you know, what drove the innovations. Um and, you know, and it was the U.S. willingness to say these are patentable inventions to which we are going to apply novelty and non-obvious to to figure out, which was a key to creating kind of this foundation for stable and reliable property rights that drove venture capital in investments and the creation of whole new companies like Genentech and others. So, um, you know, so I am less worried about you know, oh, this is going to somehow blockade research and development because the actual historical practice is the exact opposite to the extent to which, you know, there was a massive explosion in biotech research and development and innovation. When did that occur? The 1980s and 90s <laughs> and early aughts. And that's exactly when we were providing the exact those exact protections to iso isolated molecules. And uh, there's a lot of rhetoric here too. Like, Ashley, I know you're not crazy that rhetoric. You're, you're the, you're the true geek. So you're like, I get the, I get the science. I know the technology, right? The arguments that are, are being made in the policy debates, there are literally op-eds being published by law professors, George Contreras and others saying, oh my God, if this legislation reform act is enacted, this patent eligibility reform act, you know, they'll, they'll get patents on your genes and your bodies. And it's just like, you know, and that's just, that's just not true. <laughs> and it never was true. The judge also shared some insights with us, and this comes from the perspective of personally being involved in the legislative drafting process. Uh, active work, as I said, is being done right now uh, on trying to strengthen, clarify, sharpen the language. Great attention is being paid to the word non-technological, and various substitutes are on the table being uh, considered. Um, now, if you were to press me and say, well, can you assure certain people who are nervous that this bill is absolutely foolproof and there can never be any unintended consequences? No, of course I can't. No one can because you can't predict the future. No bill is perfect. Uh, but uh, are the risks ones that could prudently be accepted? Absolutely. In my opinion, the risks are quite small uh, and people should just get their courage up. Because we need reform so badly, we shouldn't let it fail because some people were overly nervous. Uh, now, uh, in terms of clarity of the uh, exclusions, that's also being worked on very actively. Uh, and we've had um, on our drafting group uh, people from all backgrounds, uh, including independent inventors. This is not just a big company kind of thing at all. Uh, and we've had people from all different technologies, from the what I'll call the computer world and the pharma world and so on. Um, so everybody's viewpoints and, and risks and concerns have been taken into account. I myself don't see any appreciable chance that appropriate inventions uh, in the uh, uh, 
computer technology arena uh, will will get uh, fenced out. I, I think there's no serious risk uh, of that. People are right to be concerned about it, but I don't think there's a serious risk about that. And if the risk can be further reduced from an already low level to a very low level by more tinkering with language, I'm all for it. I've been participating daily, hourly, even this week yeah, in, in those kind of refinements. We have a, a group of extremely thoughtful uh, experts working on this. Uh, and of course, it's also being vetted by uh, people in the patent office and by uh, people on the staffs of, of uh, all the senators on the uh, IP subcommittee. The membership just newly announced yesterday, as you know, no surprises really, uh, at least in my view. Um, so uh, I, I think uh, the, the, the big risk that scares me is that uh, it'll get bogged down and not pass. The risk that it will get passed and will hurt innovation is minuscule. Adam comes to a similar conclusion. As he said earlier, while there is a need for language correction. All in all, I mean, I think these are concerns on the margins. When bills like this are introduced, it's really important. Um, these are important first steps. It's a huge hurdle to overcome. And, you know, and we have to be really careful about letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. Unintended consequences are a frequent phenomenon in D.C. So there seems to be sufficient reason for two of the three concerns expressed. But like the judge says, this is a work in progress. So I'm at least hopeful that conversations like these can help to advocate for cleaner, simpler language with less potential for side effects. And with that, we move on to the other half of the distorted judicial puzzle and that's enablement. We're not going to spend a lot of time setting this one up because it was the entire focus of our last episode called SCOTUS in Focus, where we took a deep dive on the Amgen versus Sanofi case and its potential impact on the full scope of enablement for genus claims and the potential devastating impact, especially to life science and pharma patents. If it sounds like I just made up a bunch of words, go check out that episode. The Supreme Court is taking this case on, and by the time this episode publishes, opening arguments will have already begun. In response to my question as to whether or not this case is our best hope for clarity on the problem of enablement, the responses were less than optimistic. <laughs> so, um, I'm sorry, Josh, when I laughed when you said, is this case our best hope for clarity? Because uh, anyone who is a betting person uh, uh, can't, uh, the last thing you would expect from the uh, Supreme Court and patent law is clarity, <laughs> I'm afraid that, you know, based on the Supreme Court's track record of the past 20 years, and and I mean, and the Supreme Court has really re-engaged with patent law to, at a level we haven't seen for about 100 years now. The majority of those decisions um, have been, um, you know, have, you know, muddied the doctrinal waters at best and have uh, eliminated or weakened patent rights um, at worst. The biggest concerns center around one, the ability for the court to adequately understand the science, and two, the hope that the court is not misled or doesn't buy into flimsy rhetoric around the history of genus claims in U.S. patent law. And for added context, the Juno case the judge will refer to momentarily is a similar enablement case that he believes the Supreme Court should have taken up instead of Amgen. Now the question becomes, uh, can they be helpful? Uh, can they understand uh, what's going on here? Uh, and I'm worried that they won't understand the scientific realities well enough to adjust the two doctrines, written description and enablement, just to give them headline titles, um, uh, in a way that will work for, for the human health uh, uh, technologies and industries and companies. Uh, why? Because you have to understand a lot about science. Uh, in order to understand why genus claims uh, have to be broad and why it's impossible to uh, test and prove out every potential um, variant uh, in, in the genus. Because in the Juno case, the record said there were millions of billions of antibody fragments that could be used. Uh, and so the company was essentially folded because they didn't test millions and billions. Well, that's ridiculous. Would have taken forever, would have taken a fortune, would have been totally meaningless because there were workable known antibody fragments 
They were old art. They were in the books. They were being used by everybody. So uh, uh, I'm worried. Now, why am I so worried? When you look at the Myriad case, I think they basically didn't understand how genetic sequences work. But I think the Myriad case is a warning sign that they're a little weak on certain areas of science. Uh, and to the extent that Myriad decision was influenced by a shallow scientific understanding, that makes me worry that Amgen may similarly be uh, uh, affected. Like he did with eligibility, Adam also shares some helpful historical context around the allowance and application of genus claims. So I think based on its current track record, if you know one, you know one shouldn't uh, be um, uh, overly optimistic. Or, or Alan Greenspan once said, "Irrationally exuberant <laughs> about what the Supreme Court might decide in the Amgen versus Sanofi case." Um, the 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 only hope is that the Supreme Court um, is not misled um, by. Um, you know this the fear mongering um and um and and misrepresentation of the history and law of genus claims by especially by the amici um that filed in support of sanofi um and i just published an article on this in westlaw today that's publicly accessible um with uh matthew dowd um <clears throat> uh, excellent uh, attorney and um former uh, clerk of of chief judge paul michelle um, of the federal circuit um, on the calling out, you know, the fear mongering and misrepresentation of the history of genus claims in the patent system. In the in the case, you know, the genus, you know, there's a sense or this claim that genus claims are somehow new, that they're you know a creation of the federal circuit because it's always nice to, to claim the federal circuit did something new that as a way to you know get the Supreme Court to you know rule against it. Um, but in fact, genus claims have been around since the very beginning of our country. Um, they're, you know, you know, they didn't call them genus claims because they didn't have this terminology back then. But if you read the patent claims that, you know, that, that is upheld by the U.S. Supreme Court and O'Reilly v. Morris claim one, it's a genus claim. We quote it in our article to show an example of it. Um, you know, you know, it, the Wright brothers had a genus claim. This uh, Vulcan, you know, Charles Goodyear's patent on, on vulcanizing rubber was a genus claim. You know, it, it covered a whole range of different species of different embodiments in which this, um, in which this, uh, this, this process was applied for vulcanizing rubber by that Charles Goodyear figured out. Um, so these are not some kind of new crazy thing that came about because of the you know biotech revolution of the past twenty years. These are long-standing uh, uh, legal uh, devices in patents to effectively and properly secure, especially pioneering innovation, which is why we see them in the biotech innovation, because all of those innovations were pioneering inventions where they couldn't, it was inconceivable to them how to identify and specify every single embodiment. They couldn't do it. Um, and, and just like pioneering innovators in the biotech space today can't list out every conceivable single embodiment, it's impossible. Um, so this is the proper and only legal way that you can do it, which is why they 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 have existed and have been and enforced and upheld by the U.S. Supreme Court from the very beginning of our country. Um, and so, um, you know, unfortunately, I'm I'm very pessimistic about what the court will do, um, given its track record. Um, so my hope is only that it's not misled and throws out genus claims. With biotech already reeling from the eligibility mess we've discussed, and the entire business model being under attack. There's a lot on the line, not only for the economy, but for advances in human health. That's what we're really talking about here. It's what's good for more technology advances. And, you know, it's particularly important in the human health area. It's very clear to me that the human health scientists are right on the verge of huge breakthroughs in curing cancer, in curing Alzheimer's, in curing diabetes, in curing this, that, and the other, and coming up with preventions and diagnostic uh, uh, methods to early detect, uh, and on and on. So we're, they're right on the cusp of these big breakthroughs, and we're strangling the industry with stupid decisions on written decisions description, pardon me, and enablement. So uh, talk about uh, high stakes. I mean, again, the stakes couldn't be higher. Genetic medicine, personalized medicine, it's all up for grabs. And guess what? China's running wild with that now. They're advancing a mile a minute in these very technologies, and we're not. 
because we've strangled the, the uh, ability of the patent system to support and protect them. So where does that leave us in terms of a solution? My hope is just that the Supreme Court doesn't, you know, throw out genus claims, um, you know, because that would be a mistake, a legal mistake. <laughs> um, would it be one more provision we'd have to add to the Rally Act? Rally. Now, that's another important legislative acronym to remember. But before we unpack that, I'd like to talk about a host of big ticket problems that it and its close cousin, the Stronger Patents Act, seek to address. While eligibility and enablement are presently getting most of the attention, when I asked our guests to prioritize the main threats faced by the patent system and the innovation economy, two concerns immediately came to mind for each. One, the PTAB, or Patent Trial and Appeal Board, aka the Patent Death Squad, and two, the Supreme Court-born inability for patent owners to receive what's called injunctive relief to stop infringers. The Patent Trial and Appeal Board. So th this is this administrative court that was created by the America Invents Act 2011. Uh, the ironically named America Invents Act, typical Congress that it always <laughs> says the exact opposite in the title of the statute of what it enacts. Um, prior to that, if you were in, if you were, if someone was infringing your patent and you sued them for patent infringement, the battle would take place in a real court. A real court, you know, you have a jury, you have a real judge who's lifetime appointed. You want a lifetime appointed judge, you want a jury, you want due process. That's what our, our, our court system taught. By the way, that's called an Article Three court. For any of you out there who, who, who hear this term, Article Three court, it's just a real court with a jury. Um, in fact, the Seventh Amendment, our, the Seventh Amendment says you are entitled to a, a, a trial by jury for any civil matter of greater than $25 or something, <laughs> <laughs> they probably need, probably need to update that amount. But anyway, the point is, this is like a constitutional right as an American. And you know what? You don't have that right in a lot of other countries. A lot of other countries, you face three judges and they decide. And if if they're biased, you're in big trouble, you know? So this is a big part of America. So prior to 2011, your patent battles would take place in a real court. And you know what? It's not fast and it's not cheap, but it's fair. And the inventor didn't always win, but if they should win, they would. The argument was, well... Patent office isn't perfect. Every now and then they make a mistake. And if they make a mistake, there should be a cheaper, faster, more efficient, you know, uh, way to solve it other than district court. Oh, but it's got to be fair. And oh, yeah. And we're going to let the patent office take care of it. Now, that sounds pretty reasonable, right? Like, well, what could go wrong there? But, but you know, there's a term in Washington, D.C. that's a big term. It's unintended consequences, right? Oh, man. And unintended consequences there were. The whole point of creating the PTAB was we want a faster, right, more, quote, efficient, unquote, uh, process for invalidating patents. And um, and I'll tell you, I was, as I mentioned before, I was on the Hill, as uh, you know, uh, speaking with staffers and 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 other other stakeholders in the in uh, in 2010 and in, in the debates and leading up to the AIA where I, I always like to point out to them, you know, there's an old classic maxim that you can do something fast or you can do something right, but you can't do both. And I, so I kept telling them that, you know, yeah, you want, to, you want a fast process to invalidate patents? It's not going to be a right process. This AIA introduced process was called Interparties Review, or IPR, in which the validity of granted patents can be challenged by any member of the public, offensively or defensively. One way these challenges can arise is when you attempt to stop a large competitor from infringing your patent or attempt to license it to them, they often instead try to use the PTAP to invalidate the patent. Using means and design defects we'll cover shortly. This flawed invalidation process quickly became weaponized by large infringers to use someone else's technology royalty-free and to prevent new, disruptive technology from competing in the marketplace. And the PTAP's invalidation rates have been staggering. You know, the patent office has various statistics they quote that don't sound this bad, but I will tell you, the actual number is, if you look at the number of cases that have gone to a final written decision, 84% of those patents have been fully or partially invalidated. And we have the number and they can, they, you know, you can quote statistics in all kinds of ways to make them look different, but that is a hard and fast fact. And, and by the way, partially invalidated usually means the claims that matter. He's absolutely right about that. Data published on Professor Dennis Crouch's patent Leo showed that most patents tangled up in IPRs are also involved in litigation or licensing. Patents involved in litigation or licensing are considered top-tier patents and make up a very small percentage of all granted patents. 
The net effect has been a clear path to endorsed piracy, using the same patent office that granted a quality patent to an inventor to later schizophrenically take it away. So how could something like this happen? What on earth would have motivated Congress to pass a bill like this when others clearly predicted it would not end well? Congress was sold a bill of goods. You can see this because in the legislative history, Congress very clearly said, um, this is intended to be, quote, an alternative, an alternative to expensive court litigation. But why was this a need? What was the impetus for needing a supposedly new, faster, more efficient, less expensive path to invalidate patents? The answer was trolls. And not the kind with brightly colored hair you might have played with as a kid, or even the kind you find on Twitter. No, Congress was told it needed to save the world from patent trolls. You talk about brilliant a brilliant program, marketing program, influence program by big tech to, uh, oh, it, it's it's like this whole patent troll propaganda. Man, it, it was it used? Was it sold? Was it hammered in the halls of Congress? The resulting rhetoric that surrounded the patent troll narrative, which is phrases like the patent system's broken and patents are attacks on innovation, the, you know, these various phrases that were pushed into kind of the public discourse about, you know, patents and innovation, really what arose, especially in Washington, D.C. over the past uh, over the past 10 or 15 years is, for lack of a better term, a moral panic about the patent system. They sense it like, oh, my God, it's destroying the whole world, <laughs> you know, and it's just the exact opposite, of course. There can be a very well-crafted story that is so compelling. It's like you almost have to believe it. And but if you but there could be a whole nother side. I asked Randy to explain the narrative of the patent troll. We all know that there are uh, some percentage of attorneys out there who aren't totally ethical. <laughs> There's going to be some frivolous litigation. It's America. You know, when you have freedom, you you have things that are, you know, you don't hold everything down because part of it's being free and having free speech and all that. But but here's the thing. They took a few cases and, and they'll always come up with a few cases. Well, I look at this one. I said, oh, you see, there's proof. Well, OK, that's one case out of the whole country. Does that mean you have to burn the whole system down? And that's kind of what they've done. They've taken a, uh, a a few cases and they'll always point to a few different cases that all sound terrible. And that's why we have to destroy the ability of an inventor to. to... Now, they don't put it this way, but what they say is, well, we're handling frivolous litigation. Every narrative needs a convincing villain and the bad guy has to be defeated. So the patent troll became the basis for action. It was predicated upon a narrative of, of uh, uh, that everyone knows now called the patent troll, which like the, you know, the like trolls is 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 a very compelling, you know, dramatic and and um, and vivid image. But like trolls is just a myth. So like Randy says, some time ago, there were a few bad actors that bought or licensed some lesser quality patents and they weren't practicing the invention. These few bad companies started suing legitimate companies based on these patents. These bad actors are considered non-practicing entities, or NPEs, and gave birth to the concept of the patent troll. Unfortunately for the direction this ends up going, most inventors are also considered non-practicing entities, and historically always have been, but operate not in this unethical manner, but in good faith and according to how the system was designed to work. Innovators, you know, require the, you know, support, you know, that in the division of labor, people with, you know, who have the resources, the money, the capital, the infrastructure, um, you know, can, you know, can link up with through contracts, you know, the, uh, you know, the nimble innovators who have the, who have the intellectual capital and that from that, as Adam Smith explained, the wealth of nations, you know, you get this incredible maximization of, of value um, and wealth creation. Patents have then historically this kind of private property bridge it's how you get from the invention in the lab and the invention in the, the garage um the uh to 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 the marketplace um and uh, because the problem isn't invention humans have always been inventive humans have been cre inventing for thousands of years why haven't those inventions got into the marketplace um you know it, it, the 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 really fascinating you know uh, hockey stick graph that really is the most revealing hockey stick graph that ever has existed is the one that shows, you know, economic uh, uh, development and levels of innovation uh, over about a, a uh, from like, you know, over a 2000 year period from, you know, this, you know, started AD, uh, AD period to today. And it's almost entirely flat. 
from for for two thousand or for nineteen hundred years, and then you get to the nineteenth century, and then it and then it goes zoom, it goes straight up, and and that just happens to correlate with rule of law, protection of rights of life, liberty, and property, limited government, the development of the market, but also patents. But hey, no need to let facts and history get in the way of a good narrative. Big Tech saw these few bad actors and initiated a nationwide campaign that suggested that the patent troll problem was real and huge, even though there were only a few bad actors, and it worked exceedingly well. It is, it's is—it's been entirely uh, a policy narrative for which millions of dollars were spent um, pushing it um, into the policy debates, into the popular press. I mean, you know, earlier it was very interesting in a conversation, you know, Ashley mentioned how, you know, you know, in innovators and inventors doing startups, like they don't know about patents, but yet like I'm your grandmother or grandfather for patent troll. I mean, I've got questions from people like, what are these patent trolls I hear about? It's like, I mean, people don't even know anything about the patent system who are actually getting patents, right? But they've heard of patent trolls, which tells, I mean, tells you that doesn't happen by accident. Um, you know, and, and, and it's, and I mean, it's well-documented that this is, was a coordinated campaign pushed by big tech, um, coordinated with academics, um, you know, writing articles um, and producing junk science empirical studies, um, you know, like the claim that you know, twenty trolls cost the economy twenty nine billion dollars in two thousand eleven is a totally bogus junk science study that has been you know totally shredded in, in by academics and scholars, um, you know, and yet it like troll it continues to be cited and and referenced as the very day. Um, and, um, uh, and again, because it's, you know, it, 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 it represents this, this narrative that has been proven very effective, very, very, as uh, policy people like to say sticky. And just like that, and to this day, any entity that is not practicing their invention, but holds a patent on it is labeled a patent troll. This includes solo inventors, universities, and the like. Just about anybody who sues someone for patent infringement can be called a patent troll because it's just so easy to label them. And I was at a back, back in 2015 when Paul and I were fighting the fight against the Innovation Act. We ended up uh, kind of accidentally being invited to a luncheon in the in the house where, where they, so basically you have these lobbyists who will invite all these staff members and they'll give them lunch and they'll give them a bunch of propaganda while they're eating, right? And uh, basically um, I got invited because they didn't know who I was. So Paul and I went and base and the, and the first thing this woman said was, "Oh, the first patent troll was Eli Whitney. Eli Whitney was a patent troll." So why would big tech propagate this? Apple, Google, Microsoft, etc. All the big players leverage patents for their own success, and for what they didn't invent in house, they would buy or license patents for new innovations, paying people for their inventions. This was the private property bridge from intellectual to real capital that Adam discussed earlier. But hey. Dealing with licensing is a massive inconvenience, and it's easier and cheaper to steal than it is to respect the law or develop the technology yourself. So a weakened patent system was the goal. And this sort of crony corporatism isn't a new playbook. It turns out there's plenty of historic precedent for big companies trying to capture the regulatory state to create barriers to entry and protect market share. This just happens to be the first time that it worked. Big corporations have been trying to weaken our patent system since about 1850. Now, I don't know... Here's someone else you might want to uh, interview. Her name is Zarina Khan. She's a, a researcher, uh, an academic, and she's written about how you go all the way back to 1850. Any new technology comes out, um, it, a new industry builds around it. In the early years, there are a lot of lawsuits, and the big companies being sued for patent infringement go to Washington, D.C. and try to weaken the system. And you're talking about telephone, you know, I mean, telegraph, telephone, locomotives, automobiles, all the way up to whatever whatever the current key area of business is, that's where that's where it's happening. And right now it's big tech. And and so amazingly, our politicians held pretty firm uh, until, oh, I don't know, about 10 years ago. And what happened was now it was big tech with all of their influence, all of their, think about the airwaves they can control. Think about the things they can put out uh, that people see far and wide. The big tech's narrative sticks, Eli Whitney's a patent troll, and Congress rushes in to save the day by passing the AIA in 2011, unleashing the PTAB and its 84% kill rate. I alluded to two potential legislative solutions earlier, 
the Rally Act, and the Stronger Patents Act. In order to understand their key differences, it's important to lay out specifically why the PTAB has been such an effective WMD and what's absolutely necessary for any meaningful reform. The uh, design defects uh, in the relevant sections of the AIA were really serious. One portion of it, the part dealing with uh, post-grant reviews, was very badly designed, very naively designed by people who don't understand how litigation can, I guess the cliche nowadays is weaponize, be weaponized to uh, protect people who should have to pay or be enjoined rather than be protected. We could easily devote an entire episode to the weaponized design defects alone. And some of this can get a little technical on the legal side of things. So we're going to 30,000 foot this a little bit. Most of these defects come down to a difference in long-held legal standards in traditional constitutionally defined Article III courts versus the rules Congress established for the PTAB. Of course, the district court, you know, um, those are those are patent infringement actions where someone is asserting the invalidity of the patent as a defense. So the patent owner is, is you know, has the opportunity to win um, in, a, in a legitimate sense. Um, you know, the PTAB, the patent owner doesn't win in the PTAB. The, you know, the PTAB's sole function as an administrative tribunal is to invalidate a patent. The whole reason why it was created was to create something that wasn't a court. Um, and there's a reason why courts function well, because they follow the rule of law and due process. But the PTAB doesn't operate under the same rules, right. procedurally or substantive, as courts. There's no summary judgment. There's no Markman hearing for interpreting the claims. There's no there's no motions to dismiss. I know, you know, you don't even have a claim. Um, there, there's no discovery. There's no real discovery, right? But that's just the beginning. The PTAB omits the standing requirement as a lower burden of proof and a weakened presumption of validity when compared to legal standards used in courts. Recall earlier when I mentioned that in these proceedings of the PTAB, the validity of granted patents can be challenged by any member of the public. Anyone in, our, in the entire world for any reason can file a PTAB. People should not be allowed to challenge patents in the PTAB unless they're being charged with infringement or have actually been sued in court. Those people absolutely should have the chance to challenge the patent in the PTAB, but not stock short sellers like Kyle Bass, not troublemakers, not shills for uh, defendants who get formed uh, out of nowhere and and have no business except to file uh, petitions in the PTAB. So the most important thing is to do what courts have always done, require what lawyers call standing. That would be reform number one. The worst example I know of, well, one of the bad examples, I know a guy, the company is Valencell. It's in North Carolina. His name is Dr. Stephen LaBeouf. Um, he's the one who, who was the first person who figured out how to make biometric sensing devices work on an active body. Prior to that, if you were in a coma, they could have something on you, sensing your heart uh, rate or whatever. But if you were moving around, it didn't work. He figured this out. He patented it a long, long time before an Apple Watch ever was, was in existence. Well, at some point, Apple Watch comes out. And of course, Dr. LaBeouf has a very successful business. They're licensing this technology. Apple approaches him like they're going to license, but no, they just take it. And then he sues them over the four patents they're infringing. They then take him to the PTAB, not just for the four patents they're infringing, but for another eight patents that he happens to have. Now, how about that? No one thought, well, what happens if you don't have, have to have standing? Well, what happens is they can do whatever they want. There was even the case of a, a disgruntled ex-wife trying to uh, just invalidate her ex-husband's patent. <laughs> and we're seeing people commit extortion. You know, uh, this is the reason why people can file 40 or 50 petitions against the same patent. But, uh, and of course, there have also been cases of, of hedge fund guys, you know, uh, try to in, try to publicly invalidate a valuable drug stock right after you've shorted the, the, the drug stock, right? To unified patents, um, they don't produce anything. They are a membership organization. Big tech and others uh, pay them a fee to be a member of this organization. And what Unified Patents does is they seek out patents that their their customers want the use of, and they simply attack those patents and try to invalidate them or get a $0 license agreement. And then there's the massive gulf surrounding the burden of proof required for invalidation and the presumption of validity for the property right. These are the rocks that a patent owner has to stand on. Reform number two at the PTAB uh, again, requiring legislative amendment of the terms in the AIA itself is to 
equalize the burden of proof to kill a patent. So it's the same in court uh, and at the PTAP. Right now, it's a high standard in the court, as you know, clear and convincing evidence. In the PTAB, a significantly lower standard applies because that's what the Congress said. Uh, it goes by the name preponderant evidence for sure. That has to uh, change. The third thing that I think is fundamental, and it might require legislation, uh, would be to make it clear that there's a significant burden of proof on the part of the challenger because all these patents were examined by experts before they were even issued. And often that examination took years and an enormous amount of work by technologically savvy lawyers and examiners. Uh, yes, of course they make mistakes. All humans make mistakes. But uh, all the serious efforts to evaluate whether examination mistakes are rampant and you know as common as good examinations have shown the opposite. They've all shown that vast majority of the time, the work done by examiners is quite sound. Um, so it should be a very clear uh, presumption of validity uh, at the get-go in the PTAB, just as it is in court. But what about the administrative officials presiding over the cases of the PTAB who get to make the decisions on validity? They are given the title of Administrative Patent Judges, or APJs for short but they're not judges in any classical sense of the word. The problem is, is you have a administrative tribunal that is not constrained by any requirements of the rule of law, of due process, anything that Americans assume should occur when your rights, whether a property right or even a contract, right, have been challenged and you are, you know, and you are called upon to defend your rights uh, before a neutral administrator, uh, you know, a judge. There was a very interesting exchange, it was called oil states, which was actually addressing whether the uh, the judges, the administrative patent judges at the at the PTAB are were constitutionally appointed or not, where um, <clears throat> the attorney defending the PTAB referred to them as judges. And Chief Justice Roberts said, excuse me, what did you call them? And he says, judges, your honor. And he says, where I'm from, we we use a different term. <laughs> Some things that could be changed in the patent office would be uh, being more careful uh, about who gets assigned to what cases. There ought to be a code of ethics requiring recusal of people who have a conflict of interest. In the courts, we've had this forever, and it's quite strict. By contrast, at the PTAB, there is no code of ethics. There are no recusal rules at all that, that apply to the PTAB judges per se. That's a huge mistake that could be fixed by uh, the director, and it should be fixed by the director. And if the director doesn't fix it, then the Congress can and should. With regard to the rules of recusal applying to all the judges other than the Supreme Court, that's a whole separate problem, but uh, all the other judges are bound by strict recusal rules that are in statute. So Congress can pass a statute if the, P if the patent office doesn't fix this very fast on their own that would get rid of these conflicts. If people own stock in a company, they should not be sitting on that company's patents, uh, for example. And there's some other wrinkles that are a little more complicated, but that's a, the clearest cut uh, example. And similarly, if somebody comes into the PTAB from, let's say, 20 years of private practice where they represented, I'll just pick a name out of the air, uh, Apple for 20 years, they shouldn't be allowed to sit on Apple cases. They, they have 270 of these judges. It's not like there won't be other judges who, who can sit on the panel and hear the case. So the case will go ahead. It just shouldn't have people whose prior clientele or whose current stock holdings create a conflict. Let me tell you something. I, I never really thought about this till I got into this whole effort. You want a lifetime, you know, like if a lifetime appointed judge is not trying to get a better job somewhere. They're, they're kind of in for, for life. Whereas in an administrative court, you have judges who are like employees who, for all you know, they're certainly not, a good, not looking at going to work for you in the future, maybe for Google or Apple or one of those big guys. This problem unfortunately goes well beyond the concerns of any one APJ. 
they're they're panel stacking. Um, you know, they're they're stacking panels to reach preordained results. That needs to end. I mean, that's a fundamental breach of the rule of law. I mean, we had a huge fight in our country over this in the 1930s, over the packing of the U.S. Supreme Court by by President Roosevelt when he was upset about the court invalidating his new his New Deal programs. And everyone recognizes it's why the reason why it's called the court packing dispute. <laughs> and, um, and 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 it still shocks me to this very day that lawyers, people who are trained in the law are you know are stacking panels and are participating in stacked panels and aren't thinking to themselves isn't there something wrong with this so what does this cost an inventor to defend their property rights in an administrative body that was sold as a faster and less expensive alternative to invalidating patents so it has now become so expensive to enforce a patent let's assume a perfectly valid patent i'm blatantly infringing it i get sued i file uh, uh, in the PTAP. The, the the reality is that the total time frame could easily take five to 10 years before I can get a final result out of the courts. And it could easily cost millions of dollars, even as high as five to 10 millions of dollars. Now, most small companies can't afford that. So they're basically priced out of the U.S. justicism because we've made it too expensive, unnecessarily uh, expensive and slow and cumbersome and burdensome and all the rest. It costs, on average, a half million dollars to defend at the PTAB per case. But surely, once a patent is found valid, that's it, right? Well, you'd think so in any balanced system. Most are probably familiar with the legal concept of double jeopardy that prohibits a person from being tried more than once for the same matter after they have been acquitted or convicted. It is a long-standing and important protection against government abuse and ensures that individuals are not subjected to repeated prosecutions. Not so in this kangaroo court. Senator Chris Coons from Delaware, who sponsors one of the bills we'll talk about shortly, has said that big companies are using repeated challenges to just muscle their way over even the most valid patent by invalidating or weakening it through repeated challenges. Patent owner doesn't get anything out of the PTAB choosing not to invalidate their patent. Um, petitioner gets everything, and the petitioner can keep filing petitions as well. In fact, they they file repeated petitions, as 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 people well know, or many people do now. Um, the, they're called serial petitioning. I'm not a particularly good fan of that because it sounds like we're talking about you know cornflakes or Rice Krispies. Um, so um, and I, so I like to make it clear that we're talking about you know companies like Samsung and Apple and others filing 30, 40, 50 petitions against the exact same patent, making the exact same arguments. And why are they doing that? Because actually, as studies have shown that their chances of a petition being granted go up. Even when the petition's been initially denied, they just refile the exact same petition. They change two sentences in it, so it's a quote different petition making, and and they refile it with the exact same arguments, with the exact same evidence. And this has been confirmed now through empirical studies that there, the chance of that petition now being granted go up. Um, that is not a system operated under the rule of law. Um, in any meaningful sense at the PTAP, where, as I mentioned, you know, patent owner doesn't get anything out of it. And so it literally is a situation where patent owner has to pay to defend their patents constantly against 40, 50 petitions, you know, 40 or 50 bites at the exact same apple, where in court you get one bite. Speaking of double jeopardy, these challenges can also come after a patent is held valid in a court under statute grounds not in the purview of the PTAB. Josh Malone, uh, so here he is, he comes out with his invention. It goes totally viral, totally viral. You have no idea how, what a, what a seller this thing is. And uh, it's being infringed heavily by Telebrands. That's a big American company, big as seen on TV company. And he gets them in a, in a real court before they get him to the PTAB. And he's fighting for a temporary injunction. And they come down with their MIT expert who who argues that, well, we're not infringing because the patent is not valid because it's unclear. Josh's patent says the uh, when the balloons are substantially filled with water, you shake the device and they fall off sealed. Well, what does substantially filled with water mean? This is an unclear term. And come on, give me a break. Anyway, the judge did not go with their argument. Josh won. Then they appealed it. They appealed it to, to the, the next level. And again, and that judge actually laughed at them and their attorneys ended up getting sanctioned for making a frivolous argument. 
So Josh was like mopping the floor with these guys in a real court. And he should have. It should have been over. But no, they take it to the PTAB, make the same argument. And the PTAB says, you're right, it's unclear. And they invalidate the patent. Now, luckily, Josh had not just one patent, but many patents on this one issue, on this one invention, which that's something inventors, oh man, you, you, you file one and you do continuations, a whole bunch of continuations. So if they take out one patent, you can fight with another. If they take out that one, you can fight with another. But uh, that was one of the things he did that, that helped him eventually win. And he eventually did win, but it cost $20 million. $20 million he and his investors had to spend to finally pull off a win. Who can do that? He's the one in a million that was able to pull it off. Uh, and uh, everybody else just gets crushed. But it can also go the other direction. Survive in court and then get dragged through the PTAB. But it's turned out not to be an alternative at all. It's turned out to be uh, a, an upfront uh, system, a prelude to court litigation. So first you have to survive in the PTAB, which takes two or three years, including appeals. Uh, and then you have to survive more challenges uh, in the court on a broader array of legal subjects in validity grounds. Uh, so the Congress's expectation that this would be an alternative, they were told that, but the way it worked out, it was the truth was the opposite of what they were told. And so uh, the, people talk about unintended consequences. I think there were unintended consequences here. The cynical part of me thinks a lot of the consequences were absolutely intended by the foes of uh, a vibrant patents, patent system. And they're many and they're large. Big tech is not at all shy about exploiting this type of weakness with its massive war chests. In a talk he gave at Columbia Law School in 2019, Bruce Sewell, former general counsel at Apple, explained that his $1 billion legal budget, that's billion with a B, allowed him to, quote, use risk as a competitive advantage, and that Tim Cook told him, quote, I don't want you to stop pushing the envelope. And look, I'm not an Apple hater. I'm recording this on a Mac, and I love my iPhone, but this is gross. We're talking about going after the inventors who are the engine of our innovation economy. Good luck selling iPhones after burning the country down. Earlier, I mentioned that there was another concern that immediately came to mind for our guests, right alongside the PTAB when prioritizing problems. That is the issue of injunctive relief. And the last pain point we'll cover before telling you about the two legislative solutions designed to tackle this and the PTAB, the infringement story unfortunately gets even worse in the broader context of another Supreme Court patent decision that inverted the power dynamic between patent owners and infringers. Used to be, and, and to anybody who's new to this issue, this is going to be a shock. Used to be, if you sued the infringer and you finally won the case, well, you could immediately stop the infringer. I mean, like, duh. Well, there was a big Supreme Court decision. Again, the Supreme Court has uh, not helped us. Uh, it was the eBay decision. The, inf the uh, patent holder won, but the Supreme Court ruled that it was in the public interest of the infringer to keep producing the invention and the court would figure out what the inventor got out of it. And what that has turned into is if you win your case, of course, with all the obstacles now, you're one of these very few people that finally end up winning a case. Uh, you have to pass a public interest test to determine whether or not you can you can get injunctive relief. And that's a very hard thing to do. If it's a startup versus a huge operation, in most cases, you're going to lose that. So the big infringer gets to keep the invention. And the court, you know, as my buddy Paul would say, some uh, English major in a robe tells you what you get. So if someone trespasses on your land, you know, or say someone comes and squats in your home, you can order them out of your house. That's what it means to have property, right? You can control how your property is used, your home or your bicycle or your computer. And if someone's using it in ways that you don't want them to, and they're not listening to you, you can get an order from a court to stop them. It's called an injunction. And since patents are property rights and have been from the very beginning, um, they've been protected with these same types of injunctions. And this is important because this is what gives patent owners the ability to go into the market and to, to enter into contracts. Because if you can't say to people, no, you have to use it on my terms, then people aren't willing to negotiate with you. And the Supreme Court uh, you know, really um, you know, undermined the ability of patent owners to obtain injunctions. So this is through judicial decisions. The courts, uh, I think, unintentionally, unwittingly, and ignorantly about what the consequences would be 
have made injunctive relief for proven infringement of valid patents extremely difficult to get, almost impossible for many, many patent owners and patent owning companies to get. Without an injunction, there's no incentive for the proven infringer to settle or to pay a reasonable royalty. So the leverage uh, that used to drive the system is now mostly gone. And that's because injunctions have been largely taken off the table. And big tech knows this. And so it's very much part of their practice of predatory infringement um, is that you know, they, they know that you can't stop them. Um, at most, you'll get damages and the damages will barely cover the cost of your lawyers after litigating for 10 or 15 years. If, if you've got the patent, uh, you should have the exclusive right to it. And you should be able to stop the infringer in a, in a regular court case. You should have your day in court. Um, if you win, you should be able to, they shouldn't be able to keep selling or producing it or using it. Um, and that's what we had for, for a couple hundred years that worked so well. You know, this has really, really undermined and, and, and crippled the foundation of patents as property rights, as drivers of economic activity, of the ability of, of, of inventors to be able to receive remuneration, proper remuneration in the marketplace through contracts and licenses. And um, in the same way that you sell your house and you can sell your house because someone just can't come and sit in it and say, I'm just going to be here and here's here's the money I'm going to pay you for sitting in your house. <laughs> and you're going to say, no, this is my house. And if you want to buy it, here's what, here's what it costs. <laughs> um, you know, patent owners used to have that ability and they don't anymore. And um, and so it's really important to restore injunctions um, to patents. How are you going to have the next great American startup if the large infringer has has stolen the technology and has flooded the market with it and they get to keep it? I think it's impossible to overstate the significance of the impact that policies like these will have on long term economic viability for the country and the impact it will have on almost everyone if something doesn't change. You can't keep inflicting this kind of pain on the backbone of the American economy, not when small businesses have accounted for two-thirds of net job creation over the past 20 years and employ half of the private sector workforce. Any small uh, company, university, individual inventor, startup, they don't have 10 or 15 years to sit around and go through millions of dollars of, of legal fees and multiple levels of lawsuits and appeals and and just to be ground down through the excessive legal process that we have in our country and to be put through the PTAB um, multiple times um, as well. So we need to uh, 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 rebalance the patent system so that it's fair and practical for small companies and even individual inventors, solo inventors, uh, because they're so important because they're, number one, more numerous. And historically, the smaller companies, smaller innovative companies have actually had the most big technological breakthroughs, more than the big companies. So we need them even more than we need the big companies. And yet we're treating them, I think, very poorly. Uh, and that has to change. We have to rebalance the system. There are fortunately two pieces of bipartisan legislation that have been designed to take on that needed change, tackling the problems of the PTAB and injunctive relief head on, but in their own unique ways. We're going to talk first about the Stronger Patents Act. This patent reform bill was last introduced by Senator Chris Coons, Democrat from Delaware, and Tom Cotton, Republican from Arkansas, in mid-2019. The Stronger Patent Act proposes various reforms of the type we were just talking about. Um, uh, if, uh, not all of the reforms you're talking about, but, but a lot of them. The Stronger Patents Act solved the problem quite well, in my opinion, of both injunctions uh, and PTAB standards in the AIA. It would have amended the AIA. It addresses the problems surrounding injunctive relief and incentivized efficient infringement by abrogating or repealing the Supreme Court's 2006 eBay versus Merck Exchange decision that we discussed. This restores the long-held principle of treating patents as private property rights by restoring the presumption of injunctive relief upon a finding that a patent is valid and has been infringed. Simply put, if you sue an infringer and win the case, you'd once again be able to stop the infringer from selling, producing, and using your invention. How it deals with the PTAB is where this philosophically differs with the next one we'll talk about. And that difference comes down to a perspective on the AIA. The Patent Trial and Appeal Board, in my opinion, has an appropriate place 
but it hasn't been well designed and it hasn't been implemented in a balanced way. Uh, I don't think the uh, American Vents Act was a big mistake. Uh, I think on balance, it did a lot of good and needed things. We've talked about those aspects the judge is referring to in prior episodes, but this is where solutions diverge a bit. The Stronger Patents Act seeks to reform the PTAB as opposed to abolishing it. One of the main ways it accomplishes this is by aligning the disparities we discussed regarding district court appeal standards compared to the tilted rules of the PTAB. If enacted, the bill would require standing in the PTAB, ensuring that a petitioner has a business or financial reason to challenge the validity of a patent. So the hedge fund managers, jilted ex-spouses, and more importantly, big tech alliance groups can't just decide to attack a patent or harass a business. It would also raise the burden of proof standards for the evidence needed to invalidate a patent, harmonizing it with district courts. This standard raises the presumption of validity in the PTAB by giving appropriate deference to the USPTO's initial expert examination and issuance of a patent, which has since been relied upon by inventors, patent owners, and investors. The bill also has provisions to eliminate the use of repeat challenges that are all too often being used to beat down and invalidate even the most valid patents. Petitioners would only be allowed to file one petition to challenge a patent unless they are later charged with infringement of additional claims. The bill would similarly establish that any entity financially contributing to a PTAB validity challenge is a real party in interest who cannot bring future challenges, ensuring that no entity can make multiple PTAB challenges as a silent financial contributor. Much of the double jeopardy concern would also be addressed by eliminating redundancy with district courts. If an IPR is instituted, the petitioner cannot bring validity challenges of the same type in district court. While in spirit everyone agrees that these are desirable outcomes, some contend that the PTAB is fundamentally flawed at its core and must be eliminated entirely. Yeah, you change things like that and blah, blah, blah. I don't know. I don't know that that would make that much of a difference because if the if the judges, if the system is already biased as it is, I just don't know if because you're because what you're dealing with is people, it's kind of like that's a subjective thing to a high degree. And you know, part of the problem you have is you, you have these uh uh these judges, they're called APJs, administrative patent judges. Recall, these are the officials who preside over the cases and decide whether or not a patent is valid. You know, the ones looking for a better job who have no code of conduct on ethics or recusals for conflict of interest. They, they, there, are, there are conflicts. There was a guy named uh, Matt Clements. He was an attorney working, you know, working, uh, 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 basically helping Apple fight patent infringement cases, right? He was their attorney. Uh, Matt Clements. He then becomes a PTAB judge in 24, yeah, I think maybe 23 of 24 cases where he is a PTAB judge hearing Apple cases where they're trying to invalidate a patent. They win, of course. And, you know, my my colleague Josh Malone was at a PTAB trial where one of our members, an inventor we know, was being uh, having his patent attacked by Apple. And there was Matt Clements again on the other side of the aisle working for Apple as an attorney. Now, how the hell can this go on? You couldn't do that as a real judge. But even if you squared some of that up to eliminate the egregious issues, Randy says that this problem is deeply institutionalized. So here Google and big tech are helping get this law passed using a lot of influence, a lot of lobbying, a lot of propaganda. Get the law passed. And of course, this thing's going to be run by the patent office. It's going to be set up by the director of the patent office. Well, next thing you know, the former head of patent strategy at Google is appointed as the director of our patent office. How about that? Talk about capture of an agency. Wow. Her name was Michelle Lee. Look it up. Michelle Lee, former head of patent strategy at Google, was appointed as the director of our patent office. Now, of course, she set the the court up, the administrative court. Oh, she hired the judges, made the rules, weaponized it, turned it into a patent killing machine. Randy also makes the argument for simplicity in that any reform that keeps the PTAB alive is just adding complexity to complexity. And it's not the solution. The, The solution is we want our day in court. You could make a bunch of changes to the PTAB theoretically, and maybe, maybe it would be, it would be more fair. Certainly, it would be more fair. Would it? But here's my my argument: Would it still protect the little guy? I know that those changes in that bill, which would would help larger players who care about patents, but what about the small player who doesn't have money, who may not have but one or two patents, doesn't have a bunch of attorneys? 
I think that person needs needs to, uh, their day in court with a jury and uh, to be able to do it on contingency. So we, we really need, need to get back to where you have your rights, you have your day in court. It's, it's a simplicity we need to get back to. Adam offers us a bridge. Ideally, we you know the PTAB should be abrogated and eliminated. Um, that's not going to happen tomorrow. Um, and and um, uh, but you know we can move and start moving in that direction and at least limit the damage that's being done now. Um, you know, a lot of lawyers we understand you know law moves incrementally. Um, you know, uh, it, it's it you know it doesn't move in kind of ra- huge radical fashions. Um, when it does, I mean, I shouldn't say it doesn't, it does move in huge radical uh, fashions at times, but those are the rarer events. Most of the time it's incremental development. And, and, um, and I think, you know, we should move towards the long-term goal of getting rid of the PTAB. Um, and, uh, but it's not going to happen tomorrow or next year. And in the meantime, we can limit some of the damage and we can show that, uh, you know, use that that the damage that's causing as evidence for why we need to reform it and eliminate it at the same time. So um, I 100 percent agree that we should support efforts to reform it, it, to impose rule of law constraints on it. These things need to stop. Um, you know, it would it would staunch some of the the more, you know, the bleeding that we are having and some of the extreme damage that's being caused to the innovation economy and to innovators right now. Um, you know, but we should, but we should always keep the eye on the prize and on the target, which is, you know, that this, at at the end of the day, this is fundamentally an institution that can't be reformed to work well. Which brings us to a legislative solution that would eliminate the PTAB, give inventors their day in court and restore the rule of law and due process. I think, I think the real answer is we, we, we really want to get back to where we have our day in court, a real court and, uh, um, and we want to get back to what what America had that was so valuable in in incentivizing innovation. There is a bill last Congress that would do that, and has has not been reintroduced yet. That was Thomas Massey's bill, the Restoring Leadership, Restoring America's Leadership and in Innovation Act, HR five eight seven four. This patent reform bill, also known for short as the Rally Act, was last introduced by Representative Thomas Massey, Republican from Kentucky, in late twenty twenty one. It is worth noting that Representative Massey is an MIT engineer, inventor, and holder of 29 of his own patents. So simplicity. Get rid of the PTAB. This is what Massey's bill would do. Get rid of uh, the abstract ideas exception. And of course, the third big area is injunctive relief. This bill is by far the widest sweeping, most inventor and patent owner friendly legislation on the table. The bill's one pager states that it restores patent protection for inventors and mitigates a generation of laws, regulations, and court decisions that have discouraged innovation by failing to secure to inventors the exclusive rights to their discoveries. First and foremost, rather than attempting to reform like the Stronger Patents Act, it abolishes the PTAB and its 84% kill rate for the over 3,000 patents reviewed since 2011. It does so with the justification that the PTAB has proven to be a failed experiment. In practice, it is not faster, nor cheaper, nor an alternative to regular district court. It has not mitigated patent trolls, but has only made it harder for legitimate small businesses to compete. Accused infringers would still have the right to challenge patent validity in a regular court of law, which is how the U.S. patent system has worked for our first 190 years. Second, the bill strikes down the judicially created eligibility tests. Going farther than the Eligibility Restoration Act, it would restore U.S. Code Section 101 to the broad threshold question as Congress intended, allowing eligible patents for any new and useful process, machine, manufacturer, or composition of matter leaving the other gates to catch patents that would block and not promote progress of science and useful arts. Explicit bill language states that it would effectively abrogate the four horsemen of the innovation apocalypse, the Bilski, Alice, Myriad, and Mayo Scotus decisions we discussed earlier that created the confused and chaotic mess around eligibility. It does so to ensure that life science discoveries, computer software, and similar inventions and discoveries are patentable and that those patents are enforceable. Third, and like the Stronger Patents Act, the bill restores much-needed injunctive relief. Upon a finding of infringement of a patent, the court would have to presume that any further infringement of the patent would cause the patent owner irreparable harm, a presumption that could only be overcome by the infringer showing clear and convincing evidence to the contrary. The bill also explicitly abrogates the Supreme Court's eBay ruling 
and the subsequent lower court interpretations that have made it almost impossible to stop infringers from making, using, and selling pirated inventions. What that will do is cause large entities to not just steal technology, they'll actually work with you. They'll license it and it won't cost them much. It's like, it'll be a such a small amount of, of, of their uh, profits will simply go to licensing a technology here and there that's really valuable. And here and there, you'll have an inventor with a startup that'll make a huge difference because the big guys can't steal it. And you'll have the incentive to have uh, garage inventors doing things that are really valuable which we need and and which will help you know help improve our economy uh, help monopolies not take over as much and and help america stay ahead of the rest of the world and stay more secure there are some significant concerns however about the bill's viability professor dennis crouch of patently o said of the 2018 version that quote this proposal has a zero percent likelihood of passing but it has been introduced and offers an interesting discussion point ip watchdog founder and ceo gene quinn strong advocate of Congressman Massey's, has written that abolishing the PTAB at this point simply will not happen and called it a, quote, politically infeasible and impossible demand at the expense of other available solutions to improve the PTAB. You know, I mean, look, maybe maybe a valid thing to say it's uh, ambitious. It's an ambitious bill. But even if not passed, at a minimum, it can do a lot for shaping the conversation, for potentially influencing administrative and judicial decision-making, and it doesn't have to be incompatible with the path that could be forged first by the Stronger Patents Act. Certainly, Massey's bill being the, you know, the end-all solution, um, it does create a lot of uh, discussion, right? It, it's a great discussion point, um, and we certainly would like to see it passed. So it's, a, it's you know, it's it's a great piece of legislation, um, you know, and like, and it should be on the table. Um, but it is a practical matter. Yeah. It, you know, there there's not enough support for it. it it's it, it's, you know, because it's a very radical propo- proposal. You know, it, it does all it proposes to do a lot. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, and so in two respects, it's important. One is, is that, you know, it does by by just being proposed and being supported by a lot of by a lot of congressmen being you know it has a lot of co-sponsors right it 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 sets the range of discussion it you know it makes these topics appropriate policy touch discussions to- topics of policy discussion in DC which is really significant and important because they need to be it's an important part of the policy process um you know in terms of making issues now topics of policy debate that weren't being debated before um, it's an important part of the process in terms of also not just making issues part of the policy debate in, in on on the Capitol and um, in, in 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 Congress, but it's a you know important signal to to the courts and to the agencies also that you know that these are important relevant issues. Um, you know, there's significant evidence that the bills uh, that were introduced starting in 2006, um, a lot of those bills focused on topics of remedies. And those topics were slowly coming out of the bills over the years as the Supreme Court kept granting cert in cases and remedies cases like eBay um, and in others um, and in the federal circuit as well. And, you know, and I think there's a lot of evidence, not direct evidence, but evidence that, you know, the courts were getting getting the message, you know, that this is an important issue. This is an important topic and we can fix this. Um, uh, you know, it's, in fact, it's within our domain to fix it as a court. Um, and remedies uh, as remedies matter, so we we should do so, and they and they did. So those topics came out of the bills as as the courts ruled um, in uh, on the topics and in favor of the legislation. So you know it's important signal to other government actors that um, you know that you can fix this or you should fix this <laughs> if you have the power to do so, um, and um, you know and it becomes potentially the basis for actual legislation down the road as you go through that process of having the policy debate of educating people about these issues. Yes, I'm a strong supporter of the Stronger Patent Act. Uh, and I'm also a supporter of the Rally Act. I don't think you, you know, the, the two are not mutually exclusive. Both should, you know, be on the table as active, you know, uh, pieces of, of legislation that we should be debating and talking about. Um, you know, right now, politically, and 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 just as a practical matter, the Stronger Patent Act, you know, if, it, you know, if and when it gets reintroduced in the new Congress, has a very strong chance of being, you know, uh, asked upon and voted on, and I, I think we should take advantage of that.
Um, you know, I know some people are worried, oh, this, you know, by reforming the PTAB, you impliedly can see that it's, it, it can work or worse. And by reforming the PTAB, you'll reduce the damage and reduce the reasons for why it should be eliminated. But, you know, there's always going to be some damage and there's all because the whole point of this is to be an agency that does things that courts don't do. We shouldn't worry that we're we're like we're going to be papering over, you know, covering up any of the fundamental problems. They'll still be there, just that we can we can actually do some good and save some innovators now um, with the stronger patent act, and that's why I support it. Yeah, another another foothold on the, up the side of the mountain. Yeah, I know that there are a lot of congressmen and senators now who are now educated about these issues, who were completely oblivious to the destruction that has been wrought on our patent system. Um, and on our innovation economy, you know, five, six years ago, um, you know, or worse, five, six years ago, I thought, oh, yeah, the, you know, patent trolls and all these issues that this is, you know, we really have to get rid of patents. And, you know, and they've done a complete 180. Um, some of them, I think, because of, because of the efforts of people like uh, Senator Coons and, and Congressman Massey. Um, and and the work of of a lot of other people who've been supporting them in, in 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 their policy efforts, like 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 the two of you and and many others. Grassroots education, it's a big part of why we do this podcast, and we're going to get back to that in just a bit because it's absolutely one of the most actionable things we can discuss in the arena of solutions. But first, I wanted to ask our guests a question that I haven't been able to shake since researching both PTAB and district court invalidation rates while preparing for our American Inventor Horror Story episode. I got two very different but equally enlightening answers. Judge, my next question is, you know, it's a little bit more, it's a little bit more in the abstract. So, you know, feel free to push back on this one. But, you know, in our in our business, in our life, you know, we look at things and if we sometimes we feel like we're, you know, we're fighting a hundred different problems. Sometimes we try to zoom out and say, like, okay, are we are we fundamentally solving the right problem here? Is there is there a bigger issue that, that we could solve to make these hundred smaller problems go away? And that's kind of the, that's the basis for this next question. And so, you know, one of the places we've, we've often wondered if there's not a solution buried in all of this is with the role of the PTO and its weight or, you know, apparent lack thereof in ultimate um, patent validity, right? So, um, patent is a constitutionally created uh, property right. Uh, a lot of times you see them compared to um, things like title deeds, like we might have on our home or, or another piece of property, right? Uh, but at the present, this it feels like it's it's sort of a broken metaphor, right? You've got the expert agency that's the PTO. They grant a piece of intellectual property that an, an inventor builds upon and leverages, um, much like somebody would, would leverage a, a piece of property um, you know, cleared by a title company. But that's where things kind of start to break down, right? The the PTAB is invalidating patents at a clip of 80, 84%. Um, that's according to U.S. Inventor. Um, but studies have shown that even district courts are invalidating um, you know, patents or claims at an, an alarming rate of about 40% still. So you know, any, any reform that we have that's related to post-grant proceedings is potentially missing you know, a bigger issue. Um, Post-grant proceedings could be incredibly rare in a world where the, the PTO decisions were more binding than they presently are. So I don't, you know, I don't get a maybe certificate from the title company when I buy a home. In a more ideal world, it seems like, you know, we should get to the point where the determination made by the PTO was closer to something binding um, with invalidations being an extremely rare exception. Um, you know, any other system essentially leaves you with a patent pending indefinitely, right? Or, or until it's tested by the um, by the courts. So again, kind of an out of the box, more abstract question. But you know, if you had the power to change the system where the PTO decision would be more binding, like that of a title company, um, how how would you do it? Well, uh, David Kaplos and I have talked about this a lot, and we both believe in the concept of what some people call a gold-plated patent, a patent that would be extremely difficult to invalidate because it was so carefully vetted. Uh, now, one way to do this, perhaps, there are other ways, but one way to do this would be to give the applicant the option of getting an ordinary patent just through examination. But if you want to get a gold-plated patent, 
you have to go an additional step and it has to be further vetted by the central re-exam unit, but under a time limit. The problem with the re-exam system in days of old was it went on forever and ever. That's part of the reason why there's this hard stop one year deadline for the PTAB. That was to overcome the problem of, of endless re-examinations. But if the re-exam unit was adequately staffed and properly guided, I believe it could gold plate patents within a year. And if it's the choice of the inventor or the inventive entity, uh, whether to ask for the extra extra step, who can complain? If you want to get an ordinary patent and take your risks at the PTAB in the court later on, fine. You take that pathway, that fork in the road. Um, but if you want a gold-plated patent, you've got to go an extra step. Uh, and then it's going to be extremely difficult. I, I, I think you probably couldn't make it uh, utterly uh, in, uh, inviolate, but you can make it extremely difficult to invalidate, and, and you should. Uh, so I'm for exploring that option. I think the reality is the Congress will never give the patent office the money they would need for the examiner to get it right in 99% of the cases uh, in an ordinary examination. They have uh, something like uh, 9,000 examiners there. They would need 90,000 or 150,000 or 300,000. Who knows what, what they would actually need? The cost would be prohibitive. The fees would go up. Uh, it's never going to happen. So what, what you have to do is make the ordinary examination system as good as it can be as a practical matter given limited time, limited money, uh, and uh, younger uh, examiners, and also uh, inadequate prior art searching capabilities and old computer systems and other things that can and should be improved rapidly. Uh, but I am convinced that a gold-plated patent system would be the best single solution to get over the problem of patents being undependable. As long as patents are seen as undependable, the investment we need will not get made. It's that simple. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a really great question. And there's a lot in there. So let me unpack it a little bit. Um, and uh, and I'm going to start by by throwing perhaps a curveball, which is that um, I um, that I am not unhappy or disturbed by the 40% invalidation rate in district court. Um, and so uh, let me explain that now. And then <laughs> because a lot of people Say, what do you mean? How can that be uh, the case? Um, but the, you know, however you identify it, whether 70% up to 100% in some of the programs at the PTAB, that is a problem. That's an institution that is clearly out of balance. Then, as I'm sure you're wondering, but why is he not upset about the 40% invalidation rates at the district court? <laughs> um, exactly. Those are invalidation rates that you are seeing at final decisions. And so what you have in, the, in, the, in, in, in these cases is something that economists and statisticians refer to as selection effects, which means that people are making decisions about whether to continue to file a lawsuit, whether to continue to, to, to prosecute or pursue the lawsuit, whether to settle based upon information that they have at each point of the process. And at a certain point, sometimes at the very beginning, sometimes later, you realize, I'm going to lose, right? Or I'm going to win, right? It becomes clear, and so you so you settle, um, and and in fact, this is what you see. In fact, most lawsuits don't even make it to trial. So you know, and by the way, most disputes don't even result in lawsuits being filed. And so at each point, you get a smaller and smaller subset of the of of the rights at issue. And so by the time you actually get to court and actually get to a final court decision, those are the true, what we refer to as borderline cases. Those are the cases where you actually have significant colorable arguments on both sides uh, as to the legitimacy of their positions. So this explains why the invalidation rates are on 40%. And by the way, this isn't unusual in patent law. This is a phenomenon one sees in the entire U.S. court system. 
And in fact, this was studied uh, uh, by some economists back in the 80s, and it's come to refer to as the, uh, the, the uh, Priest-Klein hypothesis, which is um, uh, which is uh, Priest-Klein uh, posited that um, in any in adversarial institution, you're going to see decision rates uh, around the 50% mark. The point was really about what I just referred to earlier about selection effects, about how there's information that people are acquiring through the process that they're then selecting what to do based on that information. And that includes settling or, or dismissing or, or the judge dismisses the lawsuit, right. Or summary judgment and things of that sort as well. And so he, and, and so the, by the time you get to a court decision and even a court appeal in particular, um, you know, so pellet decisions up to you know, the pellet courts, um, you know, you you are at, at a point on the margin where someone is making a mistake. There's an information asymmetry that has not been accounted for, and so you're roughly going to have a 50-50 divide. And so you're you're filtering thousands and thousands of dispute of patent disputes out, thousands of patents out of the system. Exactly what this, by the way, this is exactly what's supposed to happen. Such that by the time you get to the court decision, those are the true cases where. It's an open question as to whether this is a really valid patent or not, or whether infringement has actually happened or not. I mean, that's why there needs to be a court decision. And by the way, so what that tells me is a 40% invalidity rate is actually good. <laughs> it actually tells you that, like, wow, our patents are really working. And I suspect what that 10% variant variance is from, you know, because you would expect it to be 50% is probably the presumption of validity at work, you know, is that kind of thumb on the scale that should exist for patents that have gone through the examination process and our property rights and should therefore be should be construed in favor of the title deed owner, which is a principle that was first adopted in U.S. courts long before the examination system was created because they adopted it actually from the, uh, uh, the canons of interpretation for title deeds, um, which the rule was at common law, if there's an ambiguity in a title deed, it's to be construed in favor of the property owner. Um, and uh, the U.S. courts incorporated and applied that to patents in the early 19th century when we didn't even have an examination system yet. They said patents are title deeds, so we're going to adopt this. It was known as a uh, canon of liberal construction in favor of the of the of the patent owner. Um, and that, and then in the 1836, that when we adopted the examination system, that reinforced the what becomes known as the presumption of validity based on the examination process as well. So my mistake, comparing a PTAB invalidation rate of 84 percent to a court invalidation rate is not an apples to apples comparison. Any given patent has an 84% chance of being viewed as invalid in the eyes of the PTAB, but any given patent doesn't have a 40% chance of being viewed as invalid in the eyes of the court. Not the same thing. Most of what we've discussed so far are threats from within. A system void of any competition can operate however it wants and sometimes still end up okay. Many experts are beginning to argue, however, that there's a real sense of urgency in addressing these internal problems because of the rapidly escalating external threat that is China's undeclared Cold War. It is impossible to sincerely talk about these issues without confronting the existential threat they pose from their adversarial exploitation. But before diving into the specifics, we want to echo Democrat Congressman Hank Johnson's and Republican Congressman Daryl Issa's recent House subcommittee comments that none of this conversation should be misconstrued as anti-Asian sentiment in the wake of a rise in harassment against Asian Americans. When we talk about China, we are referring to the Chinese government and its present authoritarian regime led by Xi Jinping. Senators, representatives, presidents, retired generals, retired judges, and the Justice Department contend that this issue is twofold. There is the well-documented historic problem of IP theft that most are probably aware of, but there's also an evolving problem of going from a country that steals technology to a country that is successfully replicating the parts of the U.S. system that worked so well for centuries but that Congress and the courts are now throwing under the bus. The Justice Department has valued China's annual theft of intellectual property at four to six hundred billion dollars per year, which amounts to a post-tax share of four to six thousand dollars per American family of four. FBI Director Chris Wray has said that this is the largest transfer of wealth in human history. Some of this is attributable to outright theft, but much is now coming from bad faith manipulation of international rule of law. Listen into comments from Judiciary Committee Ranking Member Jerry Nadler, Democrat from New York, from a recent House subcommittee hearing on courts, intellectual property, and the internet. 
And the economic front, China's entry into the free market system has failed to encourage the PRC to obey the rules and customs that govern the international economic order. Rather, it has simply enabled the Chinese government to manipulate those rules to its advantage. For example, a requirement that in certain high-tech sectors, U.S. companies work with a Chinese counterpart has become, become one of many vehicles that the PRC has used to force technology transfer to their nation. This sometimes means requiring U.S. companies to disclose key aspects of their technology in order to obtain licenses to operate within the PRC, among others. Unfortunately, there are also many documented instances of the PRC using outright illegal means to access U.S. technology, including cyber espionage and trade secret theft. In sum, while the PRC was welcomed into the free market system, it has failed to honor many of the hallmarks of good global citizenship. This is a serious challenge to a system that has historically relied in large part on assumptions that the players will act in good faith. But with the announcement of a series of national policies aimed at making China a technological leader in all important emerging areas of innovation, we cannot afford to be blind to the illicit and questionable means that the PRC is using to leapfrog the rest of the world. And then there's the success China is having from adopting features of our patent system before it got weakened. They have improved their patent system, and there are Chinese, uh, there are startups starting up in China based on Chinese patents on key technologies that should be starting up in America, but you can't invest in them because you'll lose your money because the patent can be invalidated. And so China is building the next Silicon Valley. A lot of people don't understand, you know, and it sounds like a paradox, like they're stealing our IP, but then they also create this robust, you know, patent system. So they're like, which, well, which is it? And they don't recognize that that's actually a unified part of an overall uh, domestic industrial policy agenda of theirs, right? So, you know, so notice it's 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 not that they disrespect I, IP, it's that they want to grow their economy, they want to take as much technology from us as possible and create their own technology. So they steal technology from us and they're trying to promote their own uh, citizens to produce their own innovation. Um, <clears throat> so they're, they're part and parcel of a, uh, uh, of a, unified policy of a country that's trying to become an innov- uh, a, a, a type of an innovation economy um you know by leapfrogging ahead in this kind of this this two-pronged attack steal technology from foreign innovators develop your own domestic technology um and uh, and it's been very effective for them as adam noted earlier in his analysis of patent applications in the us europe and china for the exact same inventions applications are being rejected and invalidated in the U.S. that are sailing through in China. This is no coincidence when you consider the recent congressional testimony of Mark Cohen, Senior Fellow and Director of the Asia IP Project, the Berkeley Center for Law and Technology. He noted that as, quote, someone who observes IP developments on both sides of the Pacific, that it was interesting to see that at the same time that cases like Myriad and Bilski were decided by the Supreme Court, China amended its examination guidelines to permit the very same subject matter, now ineligible patents in the U.S., to be granted in China. So our greatest international competitor has no eligibility mess to untangle, no PTAB to deal with, makes injunctions widely available, and I'm going out on a limb here, but is also probably slightly less obsessed with troll mythology. And as Judge Michelle noted, if the patents go there, the investment dollars go there. And if the investment dollars go there, So does the ensuing growth and control of the technology. You know, one of the things that we take for granted is how when you're out innovating your adversaries, uh, you're very secure. And when your adversaries are are threatening to out innovate you, man, you are you are very insecure. Your security is absolutely threatened. This begs the fundamental question. Who do we want developing the technologies of tomorrow? More from Congressman Nadler's opening remarks. Today, we see a government in China that has become increasingly authoritarian, using a vast array of technology to track its citizens and subjecting many of its people, most most notably the Uyghur population, to shocking human rights abuses. I asked our guests if the best possible solution is just getting our house in order, doing the reforms needed to get back to the gold standard, and maybe the rest of the problem will take care of itself. Or was there something more we should be focused on? There actually have been um, some, some responses and positive developments in the space in the past couple of years um, <clears throat> because people haven't recognized I think uh, that you know China has been in an undeclared Cold War with us uh, for a very long time um, and um, and they're waking up to it now 
um, <clears throat> they're realizing that, you know, that, that this is a country that is not an ally of ours. Um, and, and, but of course we've now intertwined with them so much of our, you know, global supply chain manufacturing Apple, you know, up until starting a year ago had a hundred percent of all of its products made in China. And now it's only down to like 95%, I think. I mean, it's so intertwined with that country, you know, they're, they're going to have a really hard time disentangling themselves from that country. So it's, you know, it's a real problem, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, because we never became economically intertwined with the Soviet Union <laughs> uh, during, you know, the, the last cold war. So, um, so, you know, it, it's a real problem. People are waking up to it and people are taking some actions. The tide may change. And I think a lot of the reason is China. A lot of people are suddenly waking up to the fact that China is posing a huge economic and strategic threat to the United States and a technology threat. So that sort of changed the thinking of a lot of people on Capitol Hill. And there, you know, have been, you know, recognition now of, and I believe legislation or at least regulatory action is taken about the disclosure of certain types of technologies to China and restrictions on certain trade is issues, uh, especially with respect to chips, for instance, um, and other things, um, because chips can be used in jets and, and tanks um, <clears throat> and are used by jets and tanks because there isn't a division between the military and the and the civilian economy in China the way we have in the United States. And um, and so some positive actions, I believe, are, take, are being taken. Congress does seem more focused on this issue now. In addition to the hearings we've referenced here, the House also recently voted overwhelmingly to pass a resolution to create a select committee focused on U.S. competition with China. The resolution passed in a 365 to 65 vote. But as Adam will explain, entangled manufacturing dependencies and the global need for standards collaboration further complicate this matter. But as I said, it's a complicated issue now because we we are so many U.S. companies rushed to China in the 1990s and, or, and, and the turn of the century, especially companies like Apple. And, you know, and, and to disentangle us from them in that respect is going to be very hard. Um, and we have to walk carefully because we need to make sure that we don't disrupt uh, positive aspects of the global innovation economy. So, for instance, you know, there are these private organizations called standard development organizations that uh, develop um, our technologies. What are um, so 5G, Wi-Fi, you know, but all things are standardized. The depths of the, the depths of the grooves and screws are byproduct of standard development organizations because everyone has to, because you have to know when you go to Home Depot or Lowe's, you're going to get the same screw to use. It'll fit in the same hole that you have. Um, you know, so shipping containers are, are you know standardized according to standard development organizations. And so, you know, and and of course, it's really important in technology like 5G and 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 even 4G and 3G. Um, you know, and there was a period where the U.S. government said, oh, yeah, so the U.S. innovators can't even talk with or participate with any with Huawei, uh, with any organization or institution as Huawei as a member. It's like, well, those are standard development organizations. So if there was a brief period there where the U.S. government was making noise about like prohibiting U.S. innovators who created 5G, like Qualcomm, which created 5G, from actually participating in the standard development organizations that that agree to 5G, because Huawei is also a participant and a member of those organizations. So we can't we can't do that. Um, you know, I mean, you know, uh, and in fact, if we do that, um, you know. China is engaging in various strategies to take over standard development organizations, and we are conceding the field to them then. If we prohibit American companies like Qualcomm and InterDigital to participate in these organizations, then we just basically are turning over to China the um, you know the, the ability to control the, the future of these technologies and to ensure they're based on Chinese tech. And they will then incorporate into those the, into those, those technologies Chinese norms uh, of governance, <clears throat> uh, which is, as we all well know, uh, authoritarian. It's an authoritarian regime. Um, you know the you know it's you know it's we saw that with the lockdowns in China in response to the COVID, you know, the extreme lockdowns. Um, you know that made our lockdowns look like uh, like like child's play. Um, I mean, people were literally you know starving and jumping out of their apartments because they weren't even allowed to leave their apartments. Yeah, tank, they, they, tanks or, rolling in the streets, bolted into yeah. apartments. I mean, it was, it got crazy. Yeah. People had, people had their door, apartment doors wired shut. 
Yeah. Um, so they couldn't leave their apartments. I mean, it's, I mean, I, can you imagine, <laughs> I mean, it's just, but, uh, yeah, I mean, and, you know, in the country is, you know, and I always like to point out to, you know, this is a country that's actively running concentration camps. I mean, the Uyghurs in the Western portion of, of, of that country, you know, this is, so this is not a friendly regime that is, that it respects the rights of its citizens or respects the rights of other people around the globe. And we should recognize that. For the vast majority of us, these issues and their ultimate solutions are largely out of our immediate control. But one thing that literally everyone can help with is awareness and education. It's the only way the needle's going to move. Uh, another problem, and this is not so much on the part of Congress, but of uh, the general public and the and the general media, uh, is that they think patents are some nerdy little uh, corner of the world that nobody needs to really worry about. It's only for geeks and and patent lawyers. But the reality is the whole economy is undergirded by innovation. And most of the innovation is heavily promoted by strong patents. So if you have weak patents, you get less innovation. That means less economic growth. So this is the kind of set of messages I'm trying to get across. Yeah, I mean, the the, the patent system is really essential uh, infrastructure for innovation, uh, you know, in, in the country. I've heard others, you know, refer to it as the um, backbone of the economic, you know, engine. And so, yeah, I, I getting getting the awareness out there around that, getting folks to sort of reconnect those dots, uh, you know, is 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 huge. Education is a huge part of our mission and why we invest in this podcast. And that brings us to our final solution. We chatted with each of our guests about their educational efforts, starting with Judge Michelle, who retired from his position as Chief Justice of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, the top seat in the nation's patent appeals court, so that he could speak freely and publicly about the state of the IP system. Well, throughout the decade ending in 2010, when I chose to retire, there was a steady campaign to weaken the patent system, also other intellectual property rights, but particularly the patent system. And as it gained power, I got more and more concerned that it was going to hurt the country and the economy, even compromise national security potentially. Uh, and because I was uh, on a court and I loved the work, I thought I would stay there until I was ready to be carried out in a pine box. The colleagues were great. The cases were fascinating. They were important. Uh, the lawyers were very good. Uh, but all that got washed away by my concern uh, for the future of the country. And sitting judges, quite properly, I think, are quite restricted in what they're allowed to say on political issues, uh, broad public policy questions, uh, and battles among different industries and things of that sort. Uh, and I didn't want to press those boundaries. So I decided, well, if I retire, then I'm completely free to speak. So I went from highly constrained to completely free and started out right away uh, speaking uh, just about anywhere I was invited, many different conferences and writing articles and so on. And that gained steam in the years since uh, May 2010 when I uh, stepped down uh, from the bench uh, and, uh, and looking back on it, I have no doubt that I made the right choice, at least for me. Maybe it wouldn't have been the right choice for anybody and everybody, but it was for me. And I'll tell you a quick story uh, about the, 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 that kind of thinking. Uh, I once was at a conference uh, and seated at lunch table next to uh, Justice O'Connor. And at that point, she had retired. She had stepped down from the Supreme Court. And she was very engaged in trying to revive civics teaching in the schools and the culture all around the country. Very busy with that. And she told me, you know, I really enjoyed being on the Supreme Court. It was interesting work. I think it was very important. Uh, but I think what I'm doing now is even more important for the country. Just last fall, the judge also joined forces with some other heavyweights in this space to form the Council for Innovation Promotion, or C4IP. This is a, a group of uh, companies that are extremely concerned with the health and strength of the patent system. Uh, and they've come together to provide a coordinated uh, campaign to try to revive the patent system in America. And they've uh, put up some money. Uh, in order to make that uh, as effective as possible. Uh, 
it has a small board of directors. Uh, I'm one of the four members on the board of directors, along with former PTO heads, Yanku and Capos, and also uh, fellow retired Federal Circuit Judge Kathleen O'Malley. I'm uh, allied with anybody and everybody that I can be allied with to try to work uh, on uh, uh, promoting and assuring the future of the country and our economy and uh, employment and good paying jobs and technological leadership and uh, and all the rest, uh, as I say, including even national security, because the weakness of the patent system is not only hurting employment compared to what it otherwise could be, should be, uh, and not only hurting um, uh, industrial uh, technology leadership, but uh, even things critical to national security are flagging, in my opinion, because the patent system has become so weak. And I think people don't understand why the weakness matters. As the president of an organization that is dedicated to the restoration of the rights of inventors and innovative small businesses, education is a big focus for Randy. Awareness is so important. I remember talking to a, a guy at a Starbucks. So I was wearing the U.S. Inventor t-shirt, right? When the word patent comes up, with this guy, the first thing he thinks of is drug companies and high prices. Now, what, huh? What about an inventor doing something valuable, right? So, so there's there's all this propaganda out there, and we just have to fight fight it through and uh, keep informing. And and to all of your uh, listeners, help us get the word out. You know, help us get the word out. Uh, this is a key key issue for this country. In a recent Forbes article on five strategies that strengthen the innovation economy. Adam's Twitter account was mentioned when talking about bringing intellectual property down to earth. In addition to it just being refreshing to know that Twitter can actually be used for down to earth constructive conversation, we discussed with Adam how he's using Twitter to educate about patents. One of the things that I really wanted to do Twitter for was to uh, was to make clear to people actually how um, fundamental the patent system has been um, to everything in our society, and it's there, there's a real sense in which. The patent system is a victim of its own success. It has been so successful in driving innovation and in, in being the basis of so many products and services that make up our modern life that people come to think of it now. People don't recognize it anymore. They, they think of it like the air we breathe and trees we see. And 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 so I really wanted to try to emphasize and show, no, that you know, you don't you shouldn't take anything we're granted from our toothbrushes to our toothpaste tubes, uh, to our Raggedy Ann dolls, to our board games like Monopoly, that all of these were patented inventions that were then deployed into the marketplace um, through licensing and other types of really innovative commercial uh, mechanisms that were themselves invented by patent owners and business persons. Um, and so on Twitter, I do a, on this date, innovation history. Um, it's what I've kind of been become known for where I highlight um, the, the anniversary of a patent issuing historically. On the day we spoke, Adam's tweet was about Alfred Crail's 1897 invention of the modern ice cream scoop. His invention, again, too, you may, you know, you may not think of it as a great invention in terms of like it's not the smartphone, it's not, it's not, you know, it's not an antibiotic or, um, or one of these, you know, incredible innovations. But it is what our patent system drives, which is it's it's all of these small little inventions and innovations that create all of these little inefficiencies in our lives that add up to, you know the modern life that we have now where we have so much free time and it's so easy to do things and it's a veritable miracle uh you know what we how we live today you know by any historical standard in talking with all of our guests i couldn't help but be inspired by their infectious optimism passion and unfettered determination to fight for a stronger patent system no matter the odds randy went broke in his fight against the aia as an individual judge michelle stepped down from arguably the most powerful judicial position in patent law to fight for its reform. Adam works tirelessly and continuously in preparing countless briefs, studies, and policy memos that help to shape the fight and dialogue in these key issues around patents as private property rights. They roll this very large boulder up a very steep hill, and all of this in the face of the seemingly insurmountable odds of large, very powerful, well-funded opposition. Trillion dollar companies with an outsized thumb on the scale dead set against every square inch of every possible solution. Hundreds of millions spent in lobbying and strategic litigation campaigns to get results from judges, regulators, and elected officials. The political realities of re-election and the background influence of PACs funded by opponents of a fair and strong patent system. 
mass media that's under-informed and over-influenced, all compounded by the churn of congressional leadership changes, the unintended casualties of compromise, and a waning interest of the public. It's daunting to think about, let alone engage. But hope is far from lost when you have tenacity, care, and grit on your side. There was an interesting common theme that started rising up in these conversations. In discussing not getting worn down by these challenges with Judge Michelle, he offered this perspective. Uh, so that's a formidable uh, opposition force. I mean, you know, fighting, uh, fighting against us, a little bit like the Ukrainians fighting against the Russian army. They got 300,000 people in, in your country. Uh, they have a much bigger army than you do, and they're close to home, and you're one little country trying to survive. That's a tough task to take on. And that's a little bit the way I sometimes feel. I don't mean to be, you know, too self-indulgent, but but it's a very tough fight because uh, of the adamant opposition of certain very powerful forces. Then we were talking with Randy, and he compared what this battle felt like to being something almost like the second American Revolution. So before it was the colonists versus the uh, suppressive, you know, uh, Eng English rule. And now it's the innovators and startups, the, the real innovators versus the huge anti multinational corporations that are trying to stop them and to to keep them down. And it, it's a real uh, I, I feel that it's very similar in a way to the American Revolution. And uh, it's so important. It's so important. And if history is any indicator, when you have a small, not well-funded, scrappy, and nimble group that cares about fighting and protecting their homeland and these fundamental values and principles, going up against a well-funded, technologically superior, well-established empire that's just fighting for better profit margins, well, that's how revolutions are fought and won. It's that level of give a damn that can make the difference. We have no choice. We have to do everything we can. Yeah. So someone like yeah. the Ukrainians, as you say. And, you know, uh, when you go back to, to the foundation of the country, uh, in the Revolutionary War, we lost almost every big battle. That's right. Yeah. Uh, and uh, our troops were underfed, underequipped, uh, short term, uh, and had many, many other handicaps. In the end, what made the difference, of course, the French alliance and the French fleet helped a lot and some French soldiers in places like your town. So there are a lot of complexities. But the overall thing was the Continental Army refused to give up. Yeah. They kept fighting. It went on for eight years before it was all completely over and there was a peace treaty. The people who want to have a viable patent system need to have the same attitude. We just can't give up. We have to keep going no matter what. And eventually we will win for the same reason you said, because, you know, for the big tech people, it's, you know, one thousandth of 1% more profit. Not life-threatening to them, no. but it is life-threatening to the small businesses, the startups, the research universities, and many other patent holders. So we just have to keep fighting. I appreciate what you're doing. I'm trying to do uh, what I'm doing. And I have to say, uh, it's not all self-sacrifice. I'm really enjoying this. It really feels very good. I think you feel the same way. I can see that in your smile and your energy and your tone of voice. Our patent system was designed for the little guy. It was for the little guy. It was, it was, uh, do you know, do you know, you, you probably know this 200 years ago, you know, think about this. Women didn't have a lot of rights 200 years ago. The Patent Act of 1790, and it described inventors as he, she, or they, giving women all the rights of men when it came to patents and copyright. And the first black owner of a patent was Thomas Jennings in 1821, well before the Civil War. Um, and he was, he was a, a black guy in New York, uh, Taylor, who invented the first version of dry cleaning and did very well with it and used his, his wealth to um, to help the abolitionist abolitionist movement and to help get relatives out of slavery, and the point is, our system was not supposed to be just for the big guys, um, and that's what it's turned into. And we have to take it back to where it's for the little guy. Big guys can use it too, but but you cannot exclude the little guys and gals. So so that that is our that is our fight, we, and we will not give up. And Adam reiterated the importance of the message and fighting on behalf of the fact. You're part and parcel of, of, of 
you know, this our our little ragtag group of uh, rebels that are <laughs> taking on <laughs> a technologically superior, <laughs> you know, big tech does appear like the Death Star, but it has its weaknesses. Um, and um, uh, and um, you're yeah, right. I mean, in and, and at the end of the day, you know, it, it, I, I'm always have been a believer that facts went out. Um, you know, you 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 stick to the facts. You 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 stick to you know making very clear what the message is. Um, you know, and in the long run, that's what that's what moves people. You know, the same thing was true in the American Revolution. Not all Americans were in favor of the revolution. I mean, right. and, you know, 250 years later, we we. We, uh, a lot of us have lost that kind of perspective that it was a hotly contested issue. There were even a lot, there were even were, you know, founders at the, at both the first Continental Congress and the second Continental Congress, like, uh, like Dickinson, who are, you know, incredibly bright and brilliant people and, and committed to liberty, who were very much opposed to uh, us breaking, who thought that, no, we should, you know, we should work very hard at trying to uh, make amends with, with the mother country. Um, and, um, and in fact, Dickinson, uh, uh, you know, one of his arguments was, you know, we're going to be crushed, <laughs> you know, we're just, we're just a little, I, I'm not, I mean, he literally said, we're just, we're going to, we're going to be, we're just a little colony. I mean, we're, you guys really think he said in the second kind of, he said, you guys really think that you can take on the largest, most successful Navy and army in the entire world at the moment. <laughs> I mean, it's just like, this is crazy. He's like, we maybe even if we're right, we're, I mean, we're not going to win this. So it's, uh, you know, it, it, but they want out, right. You know, because as he said, tenacity, it's, it's kind you know, it's the tenacity and it's the belief and, you know, in the rightness of the cause based on the, that you're fighting on behalf of facts, you know, and, and what, and, and what's right given those facts. One of my favorite uh, Benjamin Franklin quotes uh, about this was, um, we must all hang together or most assuredly we shall all hang separately. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. and he was also the one who uh who said you know that the price of liberty is eternal vigilance um mm -hmm. you know because they knew of which they spoke i'm confident there's no shortage of that didn't know what to expect going into these conversations these individuals live and breathe this topic on a daily basis and i know sometimes i get sick of hearing myself say the same things but there was so much genuine optimism and sincerity I have been fighting this fight and, and it's like, for whatever reason, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know. I, I, it is just so, it's so important. I, I was so outraged from the very beginning of what, at what they were trying to do to our system and to the little guy, to this key part of America. And that outrage has kept me going. And, uh, and I, I have this, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a positive, I have a positive outlook on this. And we are gaining ground. We're absolutely gaining ground. We're making headway. We're making the issue more known. And we, we will, we are so committed to this. If you'd like to join forces with this ragtag group of rebels or just learn more, you can follow Adam on Twitter at A-D-A-M-M-O-S-S-O-F-F, -S -S -F, where he posts regularly on patent and innovation policy, including his excellent This Day in Innovation History tweet. To learn more about or support U.S. Inventor, you can find them at usinventor.org, where you can sign their inventor rights resolution and get on their email list to be notified about calls to action for legislators. They're also a 501c4 if you're interested in helping to support them financially. This is a great organization, and they live and die on donations. If you'd like to learn more about Judge Michelle and the important bipartisan work being done by the Council for Innovation Promotion, please visit c4ip.org. And of course, check out the documentary we mentioned at the top by going to innovationracemovie.com. It's also important to note that as long as this is the world we live in, as inventors and practitioners, we cannot settle for anything less than quality when it comes to our patents. We have to focus on minimizing surface area for these sorts of challenges. What's not in our control is what the courts and Congress are up to. What is in our control is creating the highest quality patents we can under the circumstances. In practice, this means being very intentional about things like not publicly disclosing before you file, conducting thorough prior art searches, crafting claims with clear boundaries, performing design around exercises to draft around infringement vectors, writing enabling disclosures with limited functional language, understanding case law and aligning as closely as possible with both congressional statute as well as court precedent, and remembering to keep patent families open with continuations. Sometimes the best offense is a great defense. Patent wisely and... Have a good one. May the force yeah, be with you, my friend. <laughs> you as well. 
All right, that's all for today, folks. Thanks for listening, and remember to check us out at aurorapatents.com for more great podcasts, blogs, and videos covering all things patent strategy. And if you're an agent or attorney and would like to be part of the discussion or an inventor with a topic you'd like to hear discussed, email us at podcast at aurorapatents.com. Do remember that this podcast does not constitute legal advice, and until next time, keep calm and patent on. A little bit of Star happen. Wars, a little bit of patent law, you know. <laughs> we can get into some Star Wars stuff too, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Why the Jedi really should have patented lightsabers. <laughs> then they could have stopped the Sith from getting it. <laughs> I did, <didn't>, right? <laughs> could, have, could have sued the Sith for patent infringement. <laughs> I don't I don't I'm 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 pretty oh. sure, I'm pretty sure that the Emperor would have come up with the P tab uh at some point. He would have for precisely that reason. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.